Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, December 21st regular meeting of the Walnut Creek City Council. The City Council is conducting this meeting from the City Council Chamber and staff are complying with the current regulations of the California Department of Public Health and Cal OSHA for safe indoor meetings. As a courtesy and technology permitting, members of the public may continue to provide live remote oral public comment via the City's Zoom video conferencing platform. However, the city cannot guarantee that public comment via the city's Zoom video, excuse me. However, the city cannot guarantee that the public's access to the teleconferencing technology will be uninterrupted and technical difficulties may occur from time to time. Members of the public desiring to provide comments at the meeting are encouraged to attend the meeting in person. We require that all in-person attendees wear masks consistent with Contra Costa County health orders. As some attendees may be participating in their first Walnut Creek City Council meeting or their first teleconference meeting, I wanted to welcome everyone and talk briefly about the public comment process. For each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for public comment on the item. <clears throat> Thus, if you desire to speak to an item on the agenda this evening, please hold your comments until the council considers that item. Additionally, we have a section on the agenda titled Public Communications, which is for public comments on items not on the agenda. Any comments during public communication should not relate to an item that is on the agenda this evening. Consistent with section 9.5 of the City Council Handbook, 30 minutes will be initially allocated for public communications for items not on the agenda. Additional time for public communications for items not on the agenda will be provided at the end of the open session portion of the meeting if necessary. This process is consistent with section 9.5 of the City Council Handbook and will allow for all public comments to be re, uh, received during the meeting for items not on the agenda. But wait, there's more. <laughs> when I open the public comment period, use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only, which will alert staff that you have a public comment you would like to provide. We ask that everyone who wishes to speak on an item, please use the raise hand feature to state your intent to speak when the item is called. If you're attending in person, please complete a speaker identification card and line up behind the lectern at the appropriate time. Please wait your turn and once brought into the meeting, state your name and city of residence for the record. Please keep in mind that this is a city business meeting. The city council has adopted rules of decorum to ensure that meetings are conducted efficiently and effectively and that all members of the public have a full, fair and equal opportunity to be heard. All remarks should be addressed to the city council. Please do not use profanity during your comments. Given the COVID-19 pandemic and the increased number of speakers that have wanted to make comments on various issues during our meetings and consistent with city policies related to public comments, each speaker will have two minutes to make your remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. The council will accept oral comments. Written comments submitted and received up to two hours before the meeting have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record but will not be separately read into the record. To provide a live remote public comment, join the Zoom video conference meeting. The meeting ID and password are, the ID is 893-3612-6362, and the passcode is 259-750. Should you choose to not provide comments but would like to view the meeting, you may do so in one of the following ways. YouTube Live, visit the City of Walnut Creek's YouTube channel, Cable Broadcast Channel 28 in Incorporated Walnut Creek, Rossmore Channel 26, Wave Channel 29, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. You can also live stream the meeting online on the city's website. With that said, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Darling? Here. Councilmember Haskew? Here. Councilmember Wilk? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silva? Here. And Mayor Francois? Here. Next on our agenda, I'm delighted that we have a proclamation to acknowledge and honor the Lesher Center for the Arts General Manager, Scott Dennison. 
I'm going to read all of this because this is very impressive and you deserve it. Whereas Scott Dennison has dedicated his professional career and his extraordinary talents to the Walnut Creek community for 50 years, whereas Scott Dennison has served as general manager of the Lesher Center for the Arts for the past 32 years, while also serving as managing director for Center Rep Company, the City of Walnut Creek's resident professional theater company, whereas Scott Dennison graduated from Walnut Creek's Las Lomas High School, attended nearby Diablo Valley College and San Francisco State University, graduating with a degree in theater arts, whereas Scott Dennison was instrumental in overseeing the former Civic Arts Theater, affectionately called the Nut House, and the development of the city's Lesher Center for the Arts, which opened in 1990 and continues to thrive as a state-of-the-art theater complex under his leadership. Whereas Scott Dennison has brought joy to the community by passionately overseeing more than 800 annual arts events, employing hundreds of staff members, directing award-winning theatrical productions such as the A Christmas Carol, and producing the annual Shelley Awards and Chevron Family Theater Festival. Whereas Scott Dennison has guided the Lesher Center, its staff, its producers and partners through the pandemic closures in order to successfully welcome audiences safely back to the theater. And whereas Scott Dennison's leadership, innovation and contribution have made him a pillar within the arts community, this city organization and the Walnut Creek community at large now, therefore, I, Matt Francois, Mayor of the City of Walnut Creek, on behalf of the Walnut Creek City Council, do hereby commend Scott Dennison on the occasion of his retirement. On behalf of the citizens of Walnut Creek and my fellow council members, I thank you for your commitment, your contributions, and your loyalty to Walnut Creek. And I would like to also note before inviting Mr. Dennison up to say some remarks that we have a beautiful proclamation from the Board of Supervisors of Contra Costa County also recognizing all of your achievements and contributions to our community. through this. Um, I thank you guys so much for this honor. I love, oh, microphones. Okay. I'm unfamiliar with microphones. Um, I love Walnut Creek, as you know. I have made important lifelong friends here during my 50 plus years working for the arts. From the old 449 seat nut house to the now 32-year-old Lesher Center for the Arts. My job in the arts has allowed me the opportunity to visit many lands. I was off to the streets of Paris when I directed Les Miserables. I was off to London doing A Christmas Carol, Baltimore with Hairspray, Fantasy and Fairy Tales with Disney's Beauty and the Beast, Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, Fantasy Form Actors Ensemble, many productions, the Shelley Awards, and the Family Theater Festivals. I am blessed for knowing you and all of my Walnut Creek family. I have had a joyous ride at the Lesher Center. Thank you all and those before you for your support, dedication, and trust. Thank you so much. Before you sit down, Mr. Dennison, I think some of my council colleagues would like to commend you as well. Uh, council Member Haskew? Yeah, and I'm going to cheat and take my mask off because nobody can ever hear me with it on. Um, you have done such amazing things for us and that theater. Things that came to my mind are the Chevron Family Theater Festival. Um, you're also, I, I heard, the longest standing uh, member of our um, staff that nobody has, I don't know if it's a record, but you're the one with the longest standing one now. Um, 
What you have been is the heart of the theater, and it has been amazing to watch all the things you do. Um, you love that theater so much that you even threatened to encourage me to climb up into the rafters, talk about terror. Um, but you also, um, I learned, I must have gone on, I'm going to think six or more of the theater um, tours that you give, and every time you did it, I learned something new and unique at the theater. What an incredible sense of history you represent for us, and we hope you stay really close to us because we're going to rely on that for a really long time. Thank you for your family who has been such a contribution to the theater, and, and thank you for being the special person that you have been. Um, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Will. Well, Scott, I think this is the third time I've had the honor in being able to honor you in some way, shape, or form. And uh, again, you are synonymous with the Lesher Center. It's been a pleasure uh, working with you in a variety of capacities since I was first on the Arts Commission 20, 22 years ago, which dates us both. And just the fact that I was able to uh, help, help to honor the dedication of the Denison Tech Lounge in the, in the Lesher Center for the Arts today on behalf of the City Council. Uh, it, it never has someone deserved something like that more. It's, it's a pleasure to see that. You're, you've been the face of theater in Walnut Creek for so long, and your voice will live on because I don't believe there is any chance that we're looking to have other people be the voice that when people go into our parking lot structures <laughs> or out of our parking lot structures, we're gonna know that that's Scott when we go in and we go out. And, uh, and even make, making the phone calls to the Lesher Center ticket office, we hear your voice. And the legacy that you leave is profound, everlasting, and I thank you for your dedication, your service, and your friendship. Thanks, Scott. Council Member Darling. I think my fellow council members have really captured it all, and we really appreciate all your efforts and um, just the amount of work you've done for the city. And Mayor Pro Tem Silva. Thank you very much, Mayor. Scott and family, and your production family that are here tonight as well. And if we talk long enough, you might miss the curtain rising on A Christmas Carol. <laughs> um, one of the brightest spotlights in my uh, coming onto the city council 15 years ago was the ability to get to know all of you and Scott to get to know you and the work that you do. Um, you highlighted the things that you do on stage or the opening of the Lesher Center, but for me, much of what you have done for us has really been in the extras that when we call you answer. I remember the day in 2007 when you and Sue Rainey came storming through the city manager's lobby area to talk about the Chevron Family Theater Festival that you had just sold to Chevron. And what a fabulous idea that was. Um, I remember when we were doing Second Saturday Spotlight and I called and said, hey, would you give the backstage tour of the Lesher Center? And we did it the first time in 2013 and then you reprised it in 2019. And now you do it on a regular basis and I hope somebody else will. I remember when we started Community Service Day and I said, hey, Scott, you gotta have something that somebody can come help you do in the theater. And one of the favorite projects of the community is being able to go to the costume shop and sort through the shoes <laughs> and rubber band them. And we were able to sell it that way, which is great. Um, you come by the farmer's market, you and your family, and you're always willing to chat and stop and then in turn, it's easy to be able to help you with challenges such as the day that the Lecture Center didn't have power and we were trying to find somebody at PG&E on a Sunday. It's easy to help you because you help us. You have um, opened the doors to the arts and you have been willing to work across platforms. I will highlight that arts around August, you were, it wasn't just about the Lesher Center, it was about the downtown community and how can we activate it in August of all things. 
and you were willing to step up and participate in that and explore ideas such as how can we show movies on the roof of the garage. <laughs> and you can as long as the wind isn't blowing or the smoke isn't flying, but <laughs> we know we can do it. And little do people know that not only is your voice, it's on the main line of the City Hall, by the way, also. <laughs> if you don't know your, your extension dial, <laughs> 5899, um, but also that you helped f the, both the Historical Society and the Bedford Gallery when we were recording the voices for the Downtown Historical and Public Art Walk. You recruited those actors and you helped us basically manage them through that production and taping process, which was exceptional. I, um, and even as you leave, you're leaving a legacy that I am looking forward in February to be able to show to my colleagues from all over the state of California when we have the February board meet of the meeting of the board of the League of California Cities on the Hoffman stage, and you have promised me that 55 people will fit. It may be crowded, but we will, we will fit. And I think um, they are looking forward to it, and they've been going, they've been saying to me, we're going to be in a performing arts center, and I said, better yet, you're gonna be on stage. And if you get out of line, you're gonna tap dance. <laughs> Thank you for everything you have done for this community and for bringing arts into the center of what we do. Your cr production of Christmas Carol is my favorite. It is optimistic and hopeful, and not all of them are. So I look forward to many more years of being able to work with you, but also being able to experience your legacy. So thank you. I want to add too, Scott, that as one of the newer members of the council and as a planning commissioner, I didn't have the opportunity to work with you or the, or the arts community much, but you still impacted my life and you brought a lot of joy to me and my family. And I think that's true of a lot of residents who didn't get to know you personally or one-on-one. -on -one. So in terms of all the productions we saw at the Lesher, you know, Annie for my daughter's birthday and then few years later, it was Mamma Mia and West Side Story shows that we still talk about today that we sh shared an experience together as a family. Often they were birthday presents or Christmas presents, and those were very special times. And so thank you for giving me and my family that experience. Thank you for the legacy of the arts that you've given to our community. I had the opportunity to travel to London recently and saw a theater that was uh, a theater, a symphony hall, and an art uh, museum all in one. And I said, we have that in Walnut Creek. <laughs> and, and that's thanks to you and your hard work and, and the hard work of, of our great staff. So, so thank you for your legacy and, and your commitment to our city for 50 years. Thank you. And now we'd like to take a photo. And then we'll go back to Christmas. <laughs>
Is there more meeting? <laughs> there is quite a bit more. That was fun, though. Next on the agenda is a consent calendar. Does any council member wish to pull any item for discussion? Does any member of the public wish to comment on an item on the consent calendar? If so, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only. I'm sorry, sir. Okay. Yes. Let me, I'll get through my uh, announcements and then we'll hear from you, Mr. Creeling. Uh, for those who desire to provide public comment on a consent calendar hand, uh, item, please raise your hand now. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral remark. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record but will not be separately read into the record. At this time, I will ask the city clerk or if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments. And we'll accept in-person comments first. I don't see any hands raised on Zoom, but we do have a few individuals in person. Thank you. Great, thank you. That last act's gonna be hard to follow up, so I apologize if this sounds a little boring. Uh -huh. uh, Charles Crelling, Walnut Creek. I'm a lifelong licensed amateur radio operator, and I'm <clears throat> also a proud volunteer member of law enforcement. A quote from the Supreme Court, 1936. An informed public opinion is the most potent of all restraints upon misgovernment. The reason stated by local and county governments for encrypting police radio is the California Department of Justice mandate to protect personally identifiable information. The mandate provides for two approaches. One, fully encrypt all radio transmissions to selectively encrypt the dissemination of PII, which is the way I'd like to see us go. This is a guise by the state to hide police activity from the public by an overreaching interpretation of the state's privacy laws. Police in other cities have adopted and applied the encryption mandate swiftly and without notice. The Palo Alto Police Department began encrypting its radio channels in January, notifying only the news media and without public input. In April, Palo Alto residents criticize the new lack of transparency. Privacy law experts say that blanket encryption is an extreme response to perceived threats and that police radio traffic is a necessary public resource. These radio transmissions are an important window into the public has into what the police do. That's from David Snyder, executive director of the First Amendment Coalition. Experts question the ultimate outcome of police radio encryption and who it actually protects. Jake Weiner, a domestic surveillance law fellow, likened police transmissions to the public's right to record and broadcast law enforcement activities, noting that the documentation of police activity on smartphones has been a powerful driver of anti-police violence movements. So I just ask, please make a statement by not voting for the budget until we can get selective encryption in place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Creeling. My name is Stu Sims. I'm on Adeline Drive in Walnut Creek. And I just wanted to comment on the encryption proposal also. Um, I see you want to encrypt 220 radios, and I'm hard pressed to see that we have 220 police officers in uh, Walnut Creek. Um, it's a big contract. The cost per radio is $1,484 per radio times 220 uh, makes a, a significant uh, budget hit. Um, we also have some encrypted channels which are available for use, so it seems like why do more channels or encrypt all of them? But more importantly to me, um, encrypting the radio channels for the police, fire, so on and so forth, that hides what everybody's doing. Um, secrecy hides truth. Um, trials are public, this meeting is public. America is, stands for accountability. Uh, accountability in law, accountability in government, uh, accountability in our police force. 
So secrecy, closed doors, encryption, um, we don't want to hide that stuff away. If we hide those working conversations, maybe we should hide these city council conversations. Where do we stop? Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Sims. I'm not seeing any other speakers in the chamber and checking in with the city clerk to see if we have any speakers on Zoom. No speakers on Zoom. Thank you. Uh, any questions of, uh, I'm gonna ask the city attorney perhaps to respond to some of the pub public comments we heard on item 2P, which was to upgrade the police radios with encryption from Red Cloud Wireless. Yeah. So, uh, Mayor, I was um, uh, uh, raising my hand to d discuss another issue. I can discuss that issue as well, too. And I would uh, turn to the uh, to PD to further elaborate on that if they need to. But this is this encryption request is to comply with a requirement that the city has, and so that's the purpose of of the uh, modification in the contract that is before you. I wanted to raise with the council's attention that that staff does wish to remove item uh, L from the consent calendar, which is the historical society lease, and we'll bring that back to you in January for action. And then secondly, uh, pursuant to state law with regards to item 2F, 2F is the contract for the interim community development director, and this individual is a, a PERS annuitant, and under state law, we are required to identify the terms of the contract on the record before the council can act on it. And so this particular contract with Mr. Schwab sets a, a salary of $105 an hour, which is actually below the top end of the range of that position as, as exists in the city's uh, salary schedule. Uh, as a PERS annuitant and under the government code provisions that allow for the, these individuals or for individuals who are PERS annuitants to uh, be hired, he does not receive any benefits at all, so it is simply a compensation on a straight hourly rate. <coughs> It would not extend beyond December 2022. And um, this appointment is being brought before the council pursuant to government code section 21221A. And we just need to note that on the record before the council can consider that item. Thank you, city attorney. And just to follow up, uh, Steve, on the, um, on the police radios and the encryption, the, the requirement is from the state. The Department of Justice has mandated that we encrypt our radios to protect privacy and as well as any other police department in this in the state is that correct uh, that is my understanding as well but I would defer to PD to, okay. to respond to that good evening honorable mayor and city council I too am an amateur radio license holder so thank you very much um, I kind of have mixed feelings about this. When I grew up, I grew up listening to a police radio scanner, and that's how I learned a lot about law enforcement. So I appreciate the comments uh, that were delivered tonight. The intent of this law is really to protect the privacy of the people that we interact with. And sometimes even going to a call, information needs to be broadcast to officers for a, from a safety standpoint. So. The size of Walnut Creek, it's very impractical for us to have a separate channel that's encrypted to deliver that information because it requires officers to switch between channels and it often requires another radio dispatcher to, to deliver that information. And then I'll let uh, Lieutenant Slater elaborate on anything further. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, uh, uh, members of the council and Mayor Matt Francois. I'm Lieutenant Slater from the police department. I did write the proposal did the funds allocate, are already allocated funds from last year's budget that were carried over? And the request for this was simply, as the chief put, and with um, city attorney mentioned, we are just trying to be in compliance with the mandate. We don't want to be on a list that says, hey, you are out of compliance. Why have you not followed along with the state law at this time? Any questions that you have further, I would be happy to answer. I do have a couple questions. Mayor Pro Tem Silva. Um, thank you very much. One of the members of the um, public also questioned why 220 radios, and we have 220 radios. Why? Well, in addition to the portable radios that officers carry, we also have the vehicle ra radios that are done, and we also have spares, and we have um, radios that have to be ready to go in case something goes wrong, or if we add vehicles to our fleet, we have radios to install in those vehicles. 
It does seem like an awful lot, but we have, that is our inventory, and that is what we need in order to keep the public safe and be able to respond to emergencies. The other question I would ask really is the suggestion that we would encrypt only one, ch a special channel, but that would somewhat preclude the interop interoperability functionality of this whole two-county radio system, would it not? That is correct, and we would require additional staffing, just as mentioned before, about being able to actually run the personal identifying information only, plus whenever to, and an officer contacts someone and they start talking about the, someone's license plate to who's the registered owner, to who's that person, if they're wanted for um, wants and warrants for a regular check, that comes out and that could be easily put on the wrong channel and then we would be out of compliance. And the, um, this mandate from the California Department of Justice was not done yesterday. I think it's been out there for a, at least two years. That is correct. It is still, um, projected out to be done hopefully sooner than later, but this was enacted in 2020. In October of 2020 is when the mandate um, came out into effect to make sure that agencies have something in place and that we want to be uh, in compliance. You've already heard of several other cities are doing so. All we're doing is following in the um, compliance step. Thank you. Council Member Wolk. Thank you, Lieutenant Slater and, and Chief. Um, so from what I, it sounds like is this is to protect the privacy and identity of victims who may be calling as well, is that correct? That is correct. So th this really does, so victims of any sort where they're providing their name and their address, this would encrypt, this is protecting their privacy? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Council Member Darling. Thank you, thanks for the information. Um, when we were having our special meeting after the smash and grab, um, robbery down at Nordstrom, I talked to a couple friends of mine in law enforcement and they said that one of the things that encryption was doing, that they felt encryption was doing for them was they had evidence that some of the criminal organizations that were plaguing the area were using the police transmissions. Do you guys think that this will help with that? Um, I mean, not everybody listening to you is listening with good intent. Uh, that is entirely possible. And it's, it's been a common tactic that um, officers will come in contact with someone that has been placed under arrest, for pos uh, example, possession of burglary tools. And it's common to find a burglar thieving in the middle of the night, breaking into cars to carry a police scanner that would be commonly letting them know if a police officer is en route to their, co their destination so that way they can flee. It is something that we have seen over time. That was not the actual intent of this mandate, but it is something to be thoughtful of. More an auxiliary benefit. Than yes. Thank you. Any other questions with Lieutenant Slater? No, thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other questions of council members on the consent calendar? No, then I would entertain a motion with the exception of item 2L. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Haskew, a second by Council Member Wilk. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council Member Haskew? Aye. Council Member Wilk? Aye. Council Member Darling? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Silva? Aye. Mayor Francois? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, we're moving on to public communications. Uh, Mayor, if I may, did yes. you want to invite uh, the Chief or uh, PD up to speak to an event from this I weekend? I do. Thank you very much for the reminder, City Manager. I would like to invite uh, our Police Department representatives, the Chief, first to speak about a sideshow incident that happened over the weekend in our downtown area. Thank you. Jamie Knox, Police Chief. Um, yes, earlier this weekend, late Friday night, early Saturday morning, we did receive a report of a sideshow that was going on uh, in the city. We responded. I'm going to introduce uh, Lieutenant Olson, who is our acting operations captain in just a moment, but I just want to let the public know and reassure the council that we're, we are actively investigating this case. This is not a closed case. It's very much open, and we expect additional activity to include uh, potential warrants and impounding vehicles uh, in the coming future. Uh, but, you know, we do not take this crime lightly at all. It's a serious offense. A lot of damage was done to our city, and we will prosecute 
suspects to the fullest extent of the law. And I'm going to introduce uh, Lieutenant Drew Olson, who is our acting operations captain right now, while uh, Captain Brown is out on vacation. And he will uh, give a briefing of uh, what we knew at the time, our response times, what we did, and what we're working on, and then both of us will answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Chief. Uh, thank you, Chief. As you said, I'm Lieutenant Olson, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, I just wanted to give a quick briefing on uh, our response that night. Um, at about 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, Saturday morning, uh, we received a call from uh, Concord Police Department advising of a sideshow event that had uh, started to occur in their city, and they, uh, the, the vehicles had fled the area towards our city. So we sent uh, a, a plethora of units out to the, the valley, out to Ignacio, Oak Grove, Treat, Oak Grove area, um, to try and keep an eye on these vehicles. Uh, the officers didn't find any vehicles, or they checked all the, the kind of common places they would uh, congregate. Uh, different parking lots out in the valley. Um, didn't find anybody. At about 1.15 in the morning, uh, we got a call, a 911 call from uh, somebody outside the Century Theater advising of a, a sideshow event going on at Locust and Olympic. Um, officers responded. Within about one minute, we had multiple officers on scene. Uh, they made a game plan to uh, give an, a, a route for cars to, to exit because they were, you know, it, it was becoming a kind of a danger to the, the public at that point. But uh, they kind of had them surrounded on, on three sides. Uh, they gave dispersal orders. Uh, one, once, uh, once the orders were, were not adhered to, uh, smoke was deployed in the area as a deterrent. And at that point, within about four minutes of officers arriving on scene, uh, the subjects had fled the area and uh, officers uh, began kind of cataloging license plates and uh, making as many traffic stops as they could with the resources that they had. Um, at that time, there were two other calls that were uh, had, had officers tied up, which uh, one was a DUI and one was a report of a possible fire out in the rug gear area uh, at the park. Turned out to not be anything, but it, it took uh, units away from the downtown. So, um, we, we, like the, as the chief said, we are following up. Our investigations bureau is uh, actively writing warrants to uh, try and follow up on this and, and hold anybody responsible that we can. Oop, I'm dropping something. Thank you, thank you, Lieutenant Olson. I think we might have some questions for you, Council Member Wilk. Thank you, Lieutenant Olson. Um, yeah, a couple of questions. So you mentioned that it took the police about a minute to arrive. Correct. Uh, so there was a video that was spread throughout, uh, I, I saw it on several different sites, and it looked like it took, at least from the video, and I understand the video is from one perspective, but it looked like it took police about six or seven minutes until they could be seen in the video. Is there a reason for that? Well, I'm, I'm talking about we, we arrived within a, about a minute from the time we got the call. So we didn't know about it until the 911 call came in. So it's possible that uh, they were videoing from the very beginning of it, and it took several minutes for anybody, any citizens to, to call in. Uh, like I said, all of our units had flooded the, the, out in the valley looking for the possible sideshow. Um, so they were all starting to make their way back into downtown. So we. It's, it's possible that it just took a few minutes before anybody called. So there are police that are downtown, though, as, as part of essentially a sector. I don't know if it's officially a sector yet, but there are police that are downtown on Friday and Saturday nights Correct. through the bars closing. So they would have been a few blocks away. Did they notice anything going on? I, I don't know about that, but I, I, I believe that we, we sent a, a number, quite a few of our units out into the valley. And then, like I said, there were a couple of other calls that had pulled people away from, uh, away from the downtown. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, what, so what can be charged? What, what are the crimes that are being broken? It seems like reckless driving and, and nuisance, um, public nuisance, but are these arrestable charges that could even be made? Uh, yeah. What yes. We... So reckless driving is a is a misdemeanor. It can be it can be uh, there can be a charge or, or a, an arrest that can be made if we catch the person that's actually driving recklessly. Uh, we're working on uh, towing vehicles of of other participants, whether they were actually spinning donuts or uh, or, or or not. If they were uh, a part of the sideshow, we're, we're looking into ways that we can kind of impound those vehicles. Okay, that's great. Uh, what 
what tactics can typically be taken on this? Like you see, you hear about a lot of different tactics that are happening in larger cities where this occurs, whether it's stri um, uh, some kind of tire strips that are put out. Uh, I don't know how long it takes to get that out or if it's blocking the roads so that cars can't get out and then they can be impounded from there. What, what are the typical kind of tactics that can be taken? Yeah, th I mean, those are, those are some tactics that can be taken. Um, it, it really depends on what kind of staffing we have and, and the officer safety issues that we would kind of run into with, uh, with, with blocking in a, a whole bunch of people like that. Uh, if we have 10 officers and 50 people down there, um, the odds of us being able to kind of uh, deal with that from an officer safety perspective and, and that minute, it, it would be difficult. Um, so that's why we're, our officers are, are uh, following up on it later on to try and impact it that way. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I appreciate the follow-up on this. Obviously, there's a lot of things that are happening in Walnut Creek recently that uh, it's a challenging time for the city. It's a challenging time for the police department. Appreciate you really being able to put your foot forward on this. And, uh, and I think the public just wants to hear tactics and responses that we can make so that people feel safe in the city. Sure. And so I know that's a challenge, but I appreciate you stepping up for this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Wilk, Mayor Pro Tem Silva. Thank you, Lieutenant Olson. It seems to me the tactic that was used was basically to surround them and give them only one outlet to exit. Am I correct? Correct. Because at that corner, there are four ways of entering and exiting, and if you don't surround them on three sides, I guess I liken it to the Wild West and herding cattle into a fenced yard. You've got to move them like this versus surrounding them and not letting them out. Correct, and, and that's, that has to do with you know the, the amount of officers that we have at our, our disposal at any time. We did call for mutual aid from uh, surrounding agencies. Um, the cars were gone within four minutes, five minutes of us being on scene. So our, our surrounding agencies couldn't even get in to be able to help us do what, what you're, you know, so what once we're the thinking. So what's the consequence of towing and impounding the vehicle? A very large fine to get their vehicle back? Yeah, we would tow it for 30 days. Um, so then they incur tow fees and then fees from the, the tow company as well. Um, and then there's obviously, if, if we're charging them with reckless driving or vandalism, uh, then there's also penalties uh, that come with that from the legal system. All right, thank you. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Olson. Thank you for the good week work of the police department. Um, my understanding is that some citations were issued on scene, is that right? Correct, yes. Okay. And, you know, one of these incidents is one too many, obviously, but I, I just want to get a sense for, uh, you know, scale and perspective. Is this a common occurrence in Walnut Creek? In Walnut Creek, no, but in the Bay Area as a whole, yes. I mean, we we see it on the news all the time. Um, we, as an agency, have been working with our uh, partner agencies, in, uh, especially in Contra Costa County. Uh, in fact, on Saturday night, there was reports of another sideshow out in East County, and uh, the information was being shared via other police agencies that they were coming our way, same with Pleasant Hill and Concord. Um, we made, uh, uh, we had a, a high visibility enforcement in the area downtown, and we were able to deter any, any future sideshows that night. And I, I've been by the intersection a few times now, and it might be more appropriate for public works, but does anyone on staff have a sense for how much damage was caused to the pavement or the sidewalk in terms of a dollar figure? Mr. Mayor, my understanding is the damage is estimated to be approximately $11,000, and we will seek charges for restitution when we hold the uh, offenders accountable. And make no mistake, if you come to Walnut Creek and you participate in sideshow activity, not only will we tow your car, we will impound it for 30 days. If we can't arrest you, we will, and we will book you. And is 30 days the maximum, Chief? Yes. Okay, by, by law. Yes, by law. And the governor just signed, uh, I believe it's Assembly Bill 3 into law. That goes into effect January 1st, if I'm not mistaken, which would allow additional penalties by a judge for a license suspension up to six months. Okay. Council Member Darling. Just a quick question to follow up on that. I know when we had a discussion about the smash and grab, we talked about looking at the statutes to make sure that you guys have the appropriate tools. Um, 
it, you mentioned one law. Are there other pieces of legislation that might give you a stronger hand to deter this in the future? Well, the towing authority that we have, we have a few different authority sections. That's really, I think, good teeth, if you will, because nobody wants to lose their car for 30 days. On top of it being gone for 30 days, the fees are can be upwards of $2,500. My understanding is a few different bills have uh, been brought forth in the past decade when it comes to sideshow activity but they usually die and don't, don't even uh, go to vote. Uh, you know, as you know, it requires a two-thirds vote on some of these things. I think the bills were a little bit too broad, uh, you know, trying to also target uh, participants and, and uh, spectators so we'd have a little teeth to hold them accountable as well because if there's no spectators, then, of course, what's the point of doing the sideshow? So, you know, we're looking at this with as many different angles as we can, um, and we will hold as many people accountable as possible. Thank you. One more question from Council Member Will. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this may be uh, require some speculation, but I'm just curious. Do we have we seen not necessarily in Walnut Creek, but anywhere that sideshows have them developed into a looting or a gang related theft activity? Down in the Bay Area, we have seen some sideshows splinter off and do takeover style burglaries of pharmacies and or marijuana dispensaries. We haven't seen that here, and I don't know of any case where it was related specifically to a sideshow and organized retail theft, but we're certainly paying attention to that and working with regional partners to make sure that we're ready for anything. So the fact that, that we, as a police department, are dispersing them is going to be really essential to ensure that we are getting them out of Walnut Creek? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you again, Lieutenant Olson. I appreciate the update on that and appreciate the good work that the police department is doing uh, in response to that activity. It's our pleasure, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Next on the agenda is public communications. This portion of the meeting is reserved for comment on items not on the agenda. Under the Brown Act, the Council cannot act on items raised during public communications, but may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed, request clarification, or refer the item to staff. Consist consistent with Section 9.5 of the City Council Handbook, 30 minutes will be allocated at this time for public communications for items not on the agenda. Additional time for public communications for items not on the agenda will be provided at the end of the meeting if necessary. Does any member of the public wish to provide public comments at this time? If so, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you are connected by audio only if you would like to provide a public comment. For those who desire to provide public comment, please raise your hand now so that we can identify the total number of speakers that desire to speak at this time. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not be separately read into the record. At this time, I, I will note that the time is 6.48, and we will take public comments on items not on the agenda until approximately 7.18, and then the remainder of such comments at the end of the open session of the meeting. City Clerk, are there any members of the public who would like to provide comments? We have no hands raised on Zoom. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Moving on now to council member and staff announcements, reports on activities or requests. We'll start with closed session announcements with the city attorney. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this evening, the city council held a closed session. During that closed session, the city council unanimously authorized the city's participation in a national, in national settlement agreements with opioid manufacturer Janssen and opioid distributors McKesson, Amerisource, uh, Bergen, and Cardinal. Pursuant to the terms of the settlement agreement, the municipalities in exchange for release of all potential claims against those, these entities. Walnut Creek's share of the settlement proceeds is estimated to be up to $400,000 in total, payable over 18 years. All settlement proceeds are required to be spent on opioid abatement activities and other prevention programs. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mattis. Uh, city Manager report. I do not have an update this evening. 
All right, then we'll move on to city council member reports on AB 1234 activities, council member assignments and various activities and upcoming events. Okay, council member Haskew. Okay, um, <clears throat> so it was a relatively quiet time. Um, I, we had a TransPAC meeting and at that TransPAC <clears throat> meeting, we elected the second representative of TransPAC to the um, board at Contra Costa Transportation Authority and we reelected Sue Nowak as that person. Um, and she, she has the harder assignment. She's, she's with the administration and planning committee and they really have to work hard. Um, and I, I, get, I got the light one. Um, and that was the one I attend. No, that wasn't the one I attended because I actually went to the real meeting at the Contra Costa Transportation Authority and they talked about largely the issues that they've had with the uh, construction at uh, Highway 4680 and what were the challenges and it's pretty extraordinary. When you work with old roads, you can find almost anything underneath that surface if the surface is even solid and that isn't always the case. And so we're winding up with an extraordinarily good road uh, but there were lots of extra work that they had to do. We also approved a report on the East County Integrated Transit Study and what was good about that was we got a lecture or a demonstration or a showing of the pods that, that are autonomous pods that they are now testing out at Gomentum. They're um, expanding the test facility because they're trying to see how it is but there will be shoots of, of places where people, these little pods for one person or two people will go down that, that thing all autonomous um, and it's meant to be the first and last mile and it, it looks like it's very exciting technology. And last, um, I attended the uh, Diablo Regional Arts Association board meeting and there was a report preliminary of the work that was done by the consultant about what um, will happen or their suggestions for how to um, lead the theater forward um, now that we have um, a chance to really stop and look and see where we are and what we want to do with the theater. And that's it. Thank you, Council Member Wilk. All right, thank you. A couple of things over the last couple of weeks. Uh, first, the, uh, the mayor and I participated in the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity Task Force, where we collectively worked on survey questions for the community that'll be coming out in the next few months. And, uh, and so we had a, uh, a robust meeting for it being on Zoom. It was good to see it. it was the first time we'd actually had a Zoom meeting for that group. Uh, I also had the board meeting for the County Connection, and I mentioned this several months ago, but it's good to reiterate now that the general manager, Rick Ramasier, is stepping down this month. Uh, this is, that was his last meeting. He will be uh, completed his tour of duty of, I think, 25 years as of December 31st, and the assistant general manager, Bill Armstrong, is taking over. So that will be effective January 1st, next week. Uh, I was able to actually see the Christmas Carol this last week, and, uh, and that is terrific. If anybody gets a chance, I think there's a couple more days to go, get in there quickly. And the last word that I want to have is really to the public, which is uh, we just heard an update from the chief and from Lieutenant Olson regarding the sideshow. Of course, we've seen what happened with the organized retail theft of Nordstrom a few weeks ago. There was also vandalism. This hasn't been as widely communicated, but it's been out there, vandalism that happened at Heather Farm, and it's closed a couple of, uh, at least one ball field, but a couple for another six weeks. The skate park was closed for uh, the better part of a day due to vandalism. If you see something, and you see that there is some kind of activity happening in one of the park areas, or open space, or anywhere that the public uses, and that you think that maybe something's up with that because the police can't be everywhere at all times. Please call the police. This is your community. This is all of our community. And there are people that would, uh, would take advantage of the opportunity to, to cause mischief at times that really puts a hurt on everybody, all of our families, our kids, everybody. So if you see something, call. 
it, it will help to prevent these kind of things in the future. The worst thing to see that I get on emails is when something happens and now things are shut down. And now one of the ball fields at Heather Farm Park is going to be shut down until the reseeding can occur because somebody decided to go out there, break through the barrier, and then do a bunch of wheelies and, and drive around the field. And that's it. The field's now closed for a month and a half. So please call. Sorry about that. And happy holidays. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member Well, Council Member Darling. Thank you. Um, it's been a relatively quiet couple weeks, but um, two things. So the Homeless Task Force uh, met and got a couple good updates, including that the winter shelter is should be open by now. And they gave great um, commend, commendation to the city staff that helped them get that through the process and get the winter shelter open. Um, they also gave an update on the micro homes project that they're working on. And there was a, the project sponsors held a public meeting to help people um, hear about the project um, that night. And the other thing that they're noting, they're continuing to note, is that the uh, population of homeless has ticked up a little bit more than people were expecting. And um, we're looking to the core team and the hop team to you know, help work with the Trinity Center to help those people find the help they need. And one of the things that we're going to do is reach out with the um, BART people that are now been brought on board to make sure that if somebody gets off the BART train in Walnut Creek, there's a way for them to tap into services rather than just go live in the creek bottom. Um, the other thing that happened, I represent the city on MCE, which is our energy supplier. And in times of COVID, prices are going up, especially for energy costs right now. Uh, we are working on an increase in the energy price, um, which is the bad news. But the good news is, is that MCE's costs will be lower than PG&E's when we're, th we're done resetting our prices because their prices are just going to have gone up more than ours. The renewable costs have been maintained at a decent level. So we're going to be, it's more expensive, cheaper than PG&E. So that's it. Thank you. By, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Silva. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> a number of things from the last two weeks. Um, first, I'll mention that the mayor and I are two of 12 members of the board of the Central Contra Costa Solid Waste Authority, which is, uses the moniker Recycle Smart, but basically that comes down to the um, collection and processing and management of both trash as well as recyclables and organic waste. And at our recent meeting this month, we did two things of significance. One is that we adopted an, our ordinance that basically brings us com in compliance with SB 1383, which is mandatory organic waste recycling, would be the ba best phrase to use it. We've been ahead of the curve here in Walnut Creek and this central Contra Costa region for probably 10 years because we have the three parts, three different colors, and we also have our kitchen compost. The impact of this legislation, which goes into effect in early 2022, is that most significantly, we now have to have our restaurants and other food service providers of a certain size actually capturing food that can be put back into the food stream for the needy. And so we have gone through a process over the last year and a half of creating that system with White Pony Express and our largest providers of food service, which would include grocery stores and things like that, will now have to be basically not just sticking it in the green bin, but actually capturing it for reuse in the community, which is a tremendous thing. The second thing we did at our recent meeting was we adopted a reserve policy that will mean we will set aside 20% of our um, operating expenses or an amount equal to that and keep it in reserve in case of an emergency, which is a good fiscal practice. And we also updated our, um, our policies related to the redistribution of excess reserve funding to our six member agencies of, the, uh, of Recycle Smart. Um, last Tuesday, so a week ago today, was the Civic Affairs Forum of the Chamber of Commerce, and our Chief of Police, Knox, was the presenter. We had a robust discussion with the community, lots of questions to answer, and thank you very much to you and also your staff, who I'm sure were also out there sending you text messages saying, say this, Chief, say that, Chief. 
Um, but it was a good discussion, and I appreciated the questions that the business community were asking about crime and crime prevention in general, but also the issues that happened recently at Broadway Plaza and Nordstrom. Of course, and then we have a sideshow on sa Saturday morning, and you missed that opportunity. The next um, Civic Affairs Forum is Tuesday, January 11th, and it's on tech innovation and bringing tech innovation to Walnut Creek, those kinds of businesses. So go to the Chamber website, which is very similar to Walnut Creek's, but it's walnut-creek.com, and sign up for that. The Chamber of Commerce had its annual planning meeting last Thursday, and as liaison from the council, now um, transferring that to Council Member Darling, but um, we were in attendance, a number of representatives from the city. I think what I'm most impressed with about the Chamber of Commerce this year and its transition to new leadership is the collaboration with other business and technology and technical institutions. DVC was there, um, not only the city of Walnut Creek, Walnut Creek downtown and the East Bay Leadership Council. And this means that our business community is really working collaboratively to make our community better. And so thank you to the Chamber of Commerce. I had an opportunity to talk to the Youth Commission on Thursday evening and they wanted to know about me and they asked me questions. Sorry, Kevin, they didn't ask me what my favorite cereal was and I was really gonna you know, be stumped to remember what I ate as a kid, I, that's so long ago. But what I enjoyed most was they were telling me what they liked about Walnut Creek and living in Walnut Creek. And each of them, but the sense I came away with it from it was that these high school students appreciate what Walnut Creek has to offer them, not only as youth, but the, all ages in the community at large. And they talked about that. And so they're an impressive group. And yes, it is true that if those are the leaders of the future, we will be in good hands in our old age. Finally, I will mention, as I did at the um, December 7th meeting, that the Cal the League of California Cities has established its four advocacy and education priorities for the coming year. They are housing, infrastructure, including broadband, homelessness, particularly wraparound services for homelessness, and then um, climate resiliency and climate change, including drought issues, water, et cetera, wildfires. Also, the board took positions recently on two proposed, not yet um, qualified measures that could make it to the ballot. One is a, a draconian measure around taxes and fees that would have us basically in stalemate as um, communities and could be disastrous. And the board took a unanimous vote to oppose that with everything we've got. And then um, we discussed for three hours a proposed com um, citizen initiative related to land use. and. Um, we directed that we would take no position at this time, but consider continue to study it because it has many issues underlying it. The, the devil's in the details, as one might often say. And so um, thank you very much for the opportunity, Mayor. Thank you all for all you're doing for the city and for the council and representing us. Um, along with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Silva, I did attend the December 9th Recycle Smart meeting Mayor Pro Tem gave a great update on what we did. I just wanted to acknowledge and thank her as a member of the Finance Committee for moving these ag agenda items forward, especially reserve policies and allocation of funds in excess of reserve policies, policies that didn't exist before the Finance Committee called these to the attention of the board and we took action on them. Along with Council Member Haskew, I serve on the Finance Committee. We've taken action in accordance with our recommendations, so thank you to my colleagues for that on the annual comprehensive financial report and the allocation of funds in excess of the budget going towards facility reserves. Uh, Council Member Wilk uh, noted that we both uh, participated in the DEI task force virtually. I just wanted to, to relay to staff and, and to the public, I found it extremely helpful to break out into the subgroups. I thought we had a very robust and good uh, communication about um, the survey questions, and I thought that was very effective. And then along the lines of Council Member Haskew sharing uh, driving tips, I'd like to share at least one of our team commitments. These, we, we agreed on 10 team commitments as we started off on this journey on the DI task force. And the first one has always resonated with me, and it's assume positive intent and own your impact. 
So that's one of our 10 uh, team commitments. And then along with the city manager and the police chief, I attended a meeting yesterday with the owners of Broadway Plaza and Nordstrom representatives. We had a very good conversation. They were very thankful of the special session that the council had and the allocation of resources and additional police to the downtown. They remarked it, uh, how nice it is to have the street currently closed and people are taking selfies and pictures in front of the tree and enjoying kind of the freedom of not having cars drive by. We have a follow-up meeting scheduled in January and I think we have a good conversation going. One of the things we specifically talked about uh, partnering on was uh, potential legislative fixes and to the extent they could suggest them or be an advocate for them, they were uh, all ears and willing to participate. So that is my update and I'll move on now uh, to, we're moving on to consideration items. We have two items on the agenda tonight. The first item is your parks, your future, location of future combined facility at Heather Farm Park. And at this time I would invite staff to provide the staff presentation. Good evening, Mayor Francois and members of the council. My name is Janine Cavalli and I'm pleased to be presenting to you tonight on the Your Parks, Your Future project. Um, I'll be presenting along with uh, one of our consultants, Leah Martinson, with Nolan Tam Architects. And I also have members of our city working group here and we'll all be available for you um, to answer questions this evening. So I'll start with presenting Um, I'll start with uh, providing a brief project update um, first on the outcomes from phase one as well as um, the work plan that we've developed moving forward for phase one implementation. Um, then Leah will give an overview of the current conditions at Heather Farm Park before then presenting the three different future locations for the combined swim center and community center facility at Heather Farm Park. And then we'll be inviting the council to provide their feedback and select one of the three options presented this evening. There we go. So in terms of a little bit of history, uh, we started a few years ago um, on the Your Parks, Your Future project as an outcome of council priorities to renovate or replace four critical community facilities that were reaching the end of their useful life, um, including two facilities at Heather Farm Park, one at Civic Park, and another at Shaylin's Art Center. And in addition, um, looking at updating two of our parks master plans for Heather Farm and Civic Park. So combined, the four facilities and the two master plans became this all-encompassing Your Parks Your Future project. We began phase one of Your Parks Your Future project in 2018 with the focus on just the facilities, just the buildings, with the understanding that phase two would involve the outdoor spaces, outdoor areas in the two parks. We concluded phase one in February of 2020 with council direction to prioritize the replacement of the facilities at Heather Farm Park, and as well to co-locate and combine those facilities, namely the Clark Swim Center and Community Center. And then in addition, as we move forward to consider two lap pool size options, both the 25 meter and 50 meter lap pool. So now moving forward, we've developed a work plan for implementing the new facility at Heather Farm Park. 
on July 20th, 2021, this year, Council approved the study area for phase one implementation as shown in this yellow chartreuse type blob on the map before you. It was defined based on the assumptions and analysis that was performed during phase one of the project, which includes the existing swim center, the community center, and the adjacent areas. It also excludes those areas identified in the project assumptions that should remain in place, such as the all abilities playground. So you can see there's kind of a cutout there in that yellow blob. It's excluding the all abilities playground from the area where the future facility could be located. Um, so this slide outlines the work plan for phase one implementation at Heather Farm Park. The first step is to determine the location of the future combined facility, and that's the purpose of tonight's meeting. Staff are also working with the Walnut Creek Aquatics Foundation to determine an amount that can be raised towards a 50 meter pool and associated bathhouse. Once we have the location determined for the future facility, we can then be begin a conceptual design of that facility. And that would include the community center, the recreational pool, lap pool, and bathhouse, as well as any uh, adjacent outdoor spaces then that would all be included within that study area boundary I just showed you. And simultaneously, council is looking at a revenue measure to fund the construction. So that concludes the overview. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Leah and she'll provide some uh, existing condition summary of Heather Farm Park and then the three uh, location options. Hello everyone, thanks for having us here. And um, I'm gonna give an overview of the existing conditions, which is probably quite familiar to all of you, but just so we're all sort of starting on the same, same foot in terms of what we're looking at and what we're considering. So the first thing we're considering in the park are what are the existing uses, specifically the formerly program spaces of the park. And so that includes obviously all the sports fields, which are outside the bounds of this study. Um, but most significantly in our area are the gardens, the existing picnic area, and the all abilities playground. So those are these sort of program spaces that are gonna affect the adjacency and the operation of the future facility. Um, these are the existing facilities as you see them, so they're obviously separated, the community center and its ad uh, associated outdoor space, patio and terrace, and then the swim center and the associated picnic spectator seating around it, and of course the pools. Okay. Um, we know that a really important part of Heather Farm Park is the circulation, specifically the circulation path, the walking path around the pond and the walking connections between the gardens and the community center, and then between the playground and the other open spaces in the park. So we wanna be cognizant of that when we're thinking about a new building facility. Okay, yeah, thank you. Not, oh, oh, way too far. And then lastly, we're thinking about noise and acoustics and views. And these are a little bit fuzzier criteria, but more broadly, there's, um, we know that there's some key views that are really important to the users of the park, um, specifically the gardens view out onto the pond, the views of the walking path towards the pond, and the views of the from the community center and the lakeside room out onto the pond. And then similarly, it's important for the swim center to have that picnic play area around it that allows views to the pool and lets them really have spectator events in the pool functions. Um, in terms of acoustics, again, sort of broadly, there's some noise generating things and there's some noise sensitive things. And we know that the gardens are noise sensitive and there's a big concern about keeping that, um, those spaces functional for events and for the quiet activities that are happening there. And we know that the really big noise generating events are primarily the pool, the picnic area, and the playground. So when we're thinking about citing these things, we wanna be cognizant of how those interact and relate. So there's the sort of existing conditions all summarized. And I guess if there's any questions specifically, I'm happy to address those now or else I'll just keep going into the options.
Mayor Pro Tem Silva. Thank you. Um, could you go back to the uh, uh, views and noise or yeah. there? So did anyone that you talked to, I, I understand that these are the views that you have now, but there is a fabulous view that no one seems to be talking about, which is you can see Mount Diablo from the park. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> and so, and if you're on the second floor of a building, mm -hmm. such as at the greenery, which is at the private golf course across the way, or on the second floor at the garden center, you can really see Mount Diablo. And so was there any discussion of taking the opportunity as opposed to trying to protect views, but also to um, capitalize on the one that's also possible? I think that's a really excellent point. Um, no, that didn't actually come up. Can you put? Can you write that down? But absolutely, I think it's a really good point. And, and um, when we get into this a little more, we have been we are reserving the two-story, one-story off as an option. And I think that's one of the things that we really want to look at because I agree, it's some there's some great potential to that. So I think even for, from certain spots, you mm -hmm. can actually see it even from the ground. Yeah. Um, and then related to noise. You said the greatest noise producers are the playground, the picnic area, and the swimming pool? Yeah. That's it's really hard, quite frankly, to see that icon sound creating. It <laughs> it's looking a little washed out. There's a lot going on there. Um, is that? Yeah, it's the little um, dashed line circles. So they're sort of, you know, a little target area on the. Um, right. I, I could see them, but if they're. That may not be easy for the audience at home to, so I don't know if you can point using the um, pointer can tool. Can I use this on the screen? Oh, it's okay. Uh, All right, so we'll, the point is taken. Are there, oh, thank you. Yeah, so it's the circle. Now, the Gardens at Heather Farm is a nonprofit that is running six acres of our land of the gardens. The, um, are there any other organizations or entities that were concerned about sound? Yeah, the, and um, I can get to that in just a moment. We can go through the stakeholders that we spoke to because that, um, that was a relatively consistent comment that came up with a lot of people that we spoke to was concern about sound in different ways. Okay, thank you. Any other questions at this point for the consultant? Nope. Thank you. All right, so thinking about the um, future site options, we identified looking at the area that was available for the site options, sort of three potential locations um, in this sort of roughly conceptual phase. So one option is to rebuild the combined facility and the location of the existing Clark Swim Center. Second option would be to build it in the location of the existing community center. And then the third option, not unsurprisingly, is to put it in between the two of them. So these are the generally the three site options that we're looking at. Ooh, there you go. So for all of the options that we're looking at, just to start on the same page and compare apples to apples, this is the building configuration that we're starting with. Again, this is highly conceptual. It's assumed that the exact building shape and configuration would adjust and be modified as we get into conceptual design based on the specifics of each site. But roughly, we're looking at a 25,000 square foot facility roughly half and half community center and aquatic center, although those details of the program, um, there's some more nuance to that. Um, we're looking at either a 25 meter or a 50 meter pool and associated deck area, as well as what I mentioned earlier, the associated outdoor spaces, the spectator picnic area for the pool and the outdoor event space associated with the community center. Um, it's likely that the slight increase in size of the facility will require some additional parking. That's something that needs to be negotiated with planning as we move forward in design. So we're also looking at potential areas that some additional parking might be added. Um, so related to parking, again, this is a little bit down the road, but these are some of the places that might be available for parking depending on um, where the facility ends up being located. We're assuming we would not need to build out the full amount of potential new parking. Our estimated is about 40 space, additional spaces would be required based on zoning code at this point. Um, so 
Before I get into the specifics of each option, just a couple of big overviews for building costs, because I know that's a big question for all of these. The construction cost for the building is going to be basically similar for all three site options. And so by building, we mean floor, roof, wall, everything that's enclosing actual physical space. So the potential areas that there might be some cost variation are really in the site configuration. And so those are listed here. That would be if we have to bring new utilities to any of the sites, if we need to do any significant site preparation, whether that's regrading or building up the site for level ground. Um, excavating a pool is, a, an is an additional cost in the two locations that don't already have a pool in there. And then if there is any impact to the pond, whether that requires remediation or reconstruction in any way, that's likely to be an additional cost as well, obviously. Um, a potential building cost impact, again, to your point earlier, at this point, we're showing all the three options as a single story because that's the biggest site impact. But if we go to a two story, that would be a potential additional cost. And we'll kind of determine the cost benefit of that as we get further down the road in design. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so um, I mentioned stakeholder outreach. This is a list of the stakeholders that we spoke to during this process, the gardens at Heather Farm Park, the Mount Diablo Audubon Society, the aquatics programs that are housed at Clark Swim Center, and the Walnut Creek Chamber of Commerce. So from all of the stakeholders, sort of to summarize their main priorities, there was a lot of discussion about views from everyone, although they did not actually talk about the Mount Diablo view. <laughs> um, there was, yeah, there you go. Um, it was, came up a number of times with a number of stakeholders that it was important that as we're building new facilities that they're really right-sized for both current use and for potential future flexibility so that you have the best use of this um, investment. And then there was a lot of interest in maintaining the current use of the pond for recreational activities and both passive and active. And it was brought up that this is the fishing location and that we really wanted to make sure that it maintained its use for that. Um, there was, like we mentioned, a lot of discussion about minimizing the noise impacts on sensitive areas. And that was both in relation to the gardens, in relation to the, um, the adjacent natural pond, and also to the sort of passive site uses, the walkers and bikers and, um, families that are using the park sort of more informally. And then there was a big concern, which I think it will probably continue, about the impact that the actual construction activity would have, both on park use and on the recreation programming and facilities. And, and the site selection does impact how that affects. So I'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. So as a broad overview, all three sites are feasible. They will all work. <laughs> and we looked at the following criteria when we're thinking about um, site evaluation. So building configuration, and that's really how does the, the, how will the building fit on site and how much room and flexibility is there to accommodate all of the programming that we want to occur. Um, what kind of adjacencies does the site provide and what benefits and drawbacks are inherent in those adjacencies? what kind of access and circulation and parking, so that's both vehicular and pedestrian and how that impacts existing and potentially new circulation patterns. And then operations and phasing, which also includes the construction impacts and how that's gonna affect recreation department programming. And then finally, cost factors, which I talked a little bit about already. All right. So the first site option is at the existing swim center site. So as you can see, we're showing um, the existing aquatic, the, the aquatic center and the pool roughly in their current location and tucking in a new community center facility um, adjacent to the existing picnic area, probably taking over some of that picnic area to create an outdoor event space for the community center and maintaining the existing um, kind of picnic spillover area in association with the swim center. So in terms of thinking about the benefits and drawbacks to this site, for building configuration, the site is probably the least flexible. It's very constrained, both in terms of the park boundaries and also the topography. So we're really squeezing in that community center building, and it's gonna have an impact which on the existing picnic area, which will have to be relocated. Um, 
a loss for the community center is that it's losing the connection to the pond that a lot of people mentioned was so significant. And you know, again, it's, it's really impacting the picnic area. A potential downside is that this is putting the most uses the mo and also all of these potentially noisy uses in a pretty small area right next to the gardens and right next to the playground and it's really um, consolidating them in that one corner of the park. So that's a potential noise issue that we're creating. It's also potentially a congestion issue in terms of access and circulation because we've now moved the uh, majority of the activity to one corner, so it's consolidating all the, it's gonna consolidate the vehicular access to the site. Um, and in terms of operations and phasing, this probably has the biggest, most significant impact on recreational programming because it will require closing the swim center for the duration of construction, which has by far the largest impact on users and programs. It already has all the utilities for the swim center, which is the biggest utility impact, and there's already excavation on the pool site, so those are benefits. And what we heard from stakeholders related to this site, the, the biggest concern was really about the facility closure that would be required here. It was a really um, negative response to closing the swim center for two years, because those programs can't really be replicated. And there was a lot of concern about the noise impacts of putting all of that activity right next to the gardens. Um, it was also mentioned that the views towards the park are a big draw for the lakeside room rentals, and so moving that away from the pond was gonna make that potentially a less desirable space for event rentals and weddings and the like. Okay. So uh, next option is the community center site. Um, so this configuration shows the community center wing roughly in the location of the existing community center, so maintaining that um, open view and potential exterior event area connection to the pond um, with the pool and the aquatic center located on the other side adjacent to the playground. Um, we have left the option open whether or not it would impact the pond minimally, not more than 30%, although everything that we're looking at right now assumes that we're not actually touching the pond, so we don't think that's required. In terms of the benefits and drawbacks to this site, this is the most flexible site as far as building configuration goes. There's a lot of room around it. The existing driveway, the existing entryway is pretty inefficient. There's a lot of um, space that could be used for either program or building depending on how the site's laid out. Um, so there's a lot of options for how the building is oriented, how it's configured, and how that relates to the associated outdoor spaces. In terms of adjacencies, it does maintain that community center pond connection that was so important for the event. And it also locates the pool within, um, within view of the playground, which the aquatics department has said is a big plus for families and really connects those two functions. Um, like when we located at the um, swim center site, it does consolidate all of these program uses, so there's still the potential for some um, congestion as far as traffic access into this one end of the site, although less so than at the swim center site because it's a little bit more open already. Um, it also maintains the kind of key pedestrian connections between the two halves of the park. In terms of operations and phasing, it would obviously require closure of the community center, which has a some, um, some impact on recreational programming, but is easier to relocate to other community facilities um, and again, because there's more space around it and there's more direct street access, it's likely that this is a more desirable site for construction staging, which will be beneficial when we get to that location. In terms of cost, it would require new utilities for the pool, although it already has some utilities for the existing community center, and it would obviously require excavation for a new pool in this location. So the stakeholder input was that we really wanted to consider the views both of the facility, both from within the park and from the street and from the event space. And I'll note that in this diagram, we've been showing the pool on the pond side. And a lot of the stakeholders have mentioned that it would be preferable to actually flip that so that the pool is on the street side and the building provides a buffer between the pond and the, um, and the pool, which I think is a, really excellent idea and probably should be <laughs> proceeded with if we go in this route. Um, and that would also help with noise separation between the pool and the other uses of the park because if you had the building as a buffer. 
So um, the final site is this middle park site. So this is located in roughly in between the two, the community center and the pool parking lot facility. So trying to squeeze the whole thing in between the picnic area and the all abilities playground and the pond and the two existing buildings. And so it creates a somewhat linear building configuration. It allows access from both of the existing parking lots and kind of squeezes in that pool um, adjacent, somewhat adjacent to the pond. So in terms of building configuration, I think for this option, it's pretty clear that it's much more constrained site, not dissimilar to the swim center site, but we're working with a lot more existing conditions trying to configure the building around them. Um, so there's gonna be less flexibility and there's a lot less um, elbow room around it for those adjacent outdoor spaces that are so important. Um, in terms of adjacencies, the, adjacent, the proximity to the pond really requires a buffer to the pool, and I think this has some of the same issues as the, the diagram we showed for the community center site. We might wanna consider flipping the building to keep the pond towards the street side, although again, then it's constrained by the existing all abilities playground. In terms of access, circulation, and parking, this does allow access from both, of, both sides of the park and both existing parking lots, which would probably be a benefit, overall benefit for access and congestion and traffic. Um, but in terms of the pedestrian pathways, it really impedes the clear movement through the park that's so important because it puts a big building facility right in the middle of those central pedestrian pathways. Um, in terms of operation and phasing, the really big benefit, I think, to this scheme is that it would allow both facilities to continue to operate through construction, which is really why we were looking at it. Um, that's a big positive for uh, recreational programming. However, it's going to be a really challenging site for construction staging. It's going to be super hard for them to have a laydown area and get any of their trucks in, and that will probably be reflected in bid prices when you get down the road, so less awesome. Um, in regards to cost factors, again, because this is a new site with no existing building, it would require all new utilities, new excavation, and there is a grade change that happens in that area, so it requires um, site prep and some not insignificant regrading prior to construction that would have to happen there. So this is a lot of words on a table, but that's the summary of all of them, um, and I guess can take any specific questions now or I can hand it back to Janine to give a summary of what we heard from the Pros Commission and some of the other feedback, whatever you guys want to. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, let's see, maybe it makes sense to start with Janine and staff questions and then we'll, if we need uh, your expertise, we can bring you in too. I'll be right here. Can't we ask questions about the technical work and the presentation? Yeah. So I do have a few more slides if you wanted me to get through them. Um, it's the pros feedback and then I'll wrap it up. I was interested in, in the pros feedback. Okay. So if you, yeah. if you can handle that one, that would be great. Okay, so Leah just went through the three different options and also incorporated an evaluation of them as well as feedback from the stakeholders. So we took those same slides that we just presented to you and, and presented to the Pros uh, Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Commission for their feedback on October 12th. Um, they identified priorities and concerns. Uh, their top priority was to minimize the impacts on recreational services and programming to the greatest, greatest extent possible. And then in terms of their concerns, their greatest concern was really with that middle park site um, that, that Leah presented um, and the impacts on adjacent activities and views in the, in the nearby area. Um, they were also concerned about it being too constrained um, and preferred one of the other two locations um, where there already was a building on site and that would have less um, impact on the, the views and circulation, et cetera, in the park. Um, we then asked them to identify um, what parks, what sites they supported most. Um, so we didn't ask them just to pick one site. We said, you know, which of the three, um, which two do you support most? Um, and one commissioner um, was really focused on 
not impacting uh, our services to, uh, to the community. And so that commissioner selected the Middle Park site as their preference. While as all of the other commissioners um, felt the Middle Park site was the least desirable, um, they, for, the, for the reasons I just mentioned, such as impacts on, on, on views in the, in the park. Um, so we had four commissioners support the community center site, three support the swim center site, and one support the middle park site. So staff's recommendation is uh, the community center site location for the future combined facility. Um, as Leah mentioned, this site provides the greatest flexibility for the design and layout of the facility, as well as the associated outdoor spaces, maintains the pond overlook from the community center, is centrally located, and minimizes disruptions to our recreation and programming, um, particularly minimizes the impacts that would occur if it was located at the Clark Swim Center site. And the recommended action for council this evening is to provide feedback and select one of the three options for the future facility location. In terms of next steps, uh, once a location is identified, we would then move forward with a conceptual design um, that would occur over the next several months. And then simultaneously, um, now through June, City Council would be reviewing the funding strategy for how to pay for it. So that concludes the presentation. And as I mentioned, we're um, available for your questions. Janine, can I just start off with the pros commission? I know they weren't asked to select just one, but I'm somewhat intrigued by the three who selected the swim center site and why. So honestly, the way that they did it is they just said they supported it. It wasn't a matter of do you support it as your top priority? It was do you support it or not? Um, so really the way that I would categorize it is I would say they were mostly rejecting the middle park site and between the community center site and the swim center site, it didn't seem like they really had a strong preference of one over the other um, based on the comments that, that they gave us. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Uh, let's see, any questions of staff or the consultant? Council member? Okay, thank you, both of you. You might as well stand up, is it Leah? Um, so I uh, thank you for clarifying that someone suggested flipping the position. Yeah, like mirroring. Right, that. but I can also assume that a 90 degree angle to each other is not necessarily, it, it could be a V, it could be an obtuse angle, it could be linear. Yeah, I mean, they could be a bar with a lobby. To be honest, it could be an outdoor lobby with two separate, like I think at this point, the exact shape of that. So there's a lot, there's more to follow. It'd be easier though to discuss that. It would be easier if we could pick one, then yeah. all those other iterations could start. All right. Um, in your design, uh, your di it's not a design, in your <laughs> diagram, we had two squares, a 50 meter pool and, or, and a rec pool. But I assume because of the work we've done over the course of time that that rec pool wasn't necessarily a lap pool. It could be warmer water, lap pool, fun pool, exercise. It has, would have multi, you're not designing the pool. It's We're just a designing this pool. We have this blob we have on the map. We have the size to right. sort of set the site parameters. And I think um, part of the next phase as part of the conceptual design phase would be to work with you and the community to understand what amenities are really going to be in that pool and then what the shape of it is because it doesn't even need to be a rectangle honestly. So if you take site option one mm -hmm. then the swim facilities are impacted during construction Correct. and interim swim facilities are in other communities because the there is it's low likelihood we're going to build a bring in a prefab pool and above grade like they do for Olympic trials in this country. <laughs> um, but for recreation program, if we take the site option 
2, which is the rec it really impacts the community center during construction, which is offices and some programmatic. Discussion around how would we accommodate that? I mean, we still have other community center facilities as well as offices, some, I mean, portables. I mean, I, it seems that we have a, a greater ability to have interim facilities for those services during construction versus the pool. Uh, good evening, Kevin Safine, for the record, Director of Arts and Recreation. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, Thank you. It is easier to manage. <laughs> it took me a long time to ask the question. Yeah. So it's yes or no question, the answer is yes. I could uh, elaborate, elaborate on that, but um, it is easier for us to relocate basically two rooms, which is what we program at, at the community center at Heather, versus the pool activities where we don't have another 50 meter pool. Um, and the offices could be put in portables right there someplace else in the park. Or? Offices could be in the park, offices could be at Shadelands, offices could be in City okay. Hall, et cetera, correct. Did we have conversations with tennis players since they're using the same parking lot? And did we have conversations with the homeowners that reside above the park in the Heather Farms Condominium Association? Um, no, we did not reach out to the tennis players um, in terms of, I reached out to the HOA um, that is nearest where the, the, the three site locations are on several occasions, and at the end of the day, they, they opted not to, to meet with us. Their board met to discuss whether or not they wanted to meet with us, and okay. Okay. Mm. Speak now or forever hold your peace conversation. Um, parking, how much additional parking, because there's a lot of blue that's colored in, were you estimating based on the size, the number of toilets? I know it's all a function yeah. of code. The estimate, what we estimate is that it's a pro it will likely be somewhere in the vicinity of 40 additional parking spaces needed. Um, these sort of multi-use facilities, that number, always needs to be directly negotiated with planning, so I don't want to okay. promise anything without having that discussion. It will need to be a, a negotiation. And this diagram reflects? This diagram reflects all the possible places that you might potentially put, put parking maxed out. But we already have, I mean, what I was curious was, what do we currently have that is within reasonable walking distance? And I know reasonable is subjective but let's say I'm attending a wedding in the community center uh, and I am inappropriately not wearing flat shoes what um, you know is, how many parking back. spaces do we have we have a lot of parking I that am is centralized on the in there. exact number but we did um, a quick look at the total oh I don't it is way too small for me to read those numbers, but all, if you see all of the blue areas on this existing conditions diagram, that's all existing parking, including the sort of street parking lane. So there is okay. a pretty significant. So within the park oh, is 800. Approximately 800 parking. <laughs> Thanks. You can read it. You, you, <laughs> that was the, the side note. Okay. So there's, there's a significant amount of existing parking in and around Heather Farms Park, um, so that wouldn't change. And you answered my question about the view. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Darling. Thank you, and great job, guys. I love it, watching architects' minds work around these things. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, on the middle site, um, there, it sounds like some people are interested in that because the perception is, is that that would have the least impact on recreational um, opportunities, um, but if you were to begin major construction in there with a laydown area and truck access, aren't you necessarily going to be, Could can you see a way that you could have that without impacting the all abilities playground safety from a safety perspective? It would be, so it would likely be, I mean, uh, this is all prognosis without a design and without yeah. a bid climate and all of that. So, but I mean, what we often see is that there is no lay down area and that's so the contractors need to secure offsite lay down area. They don't, you know, we might, they might not provide parking. 
And all of that ends up being small but significant factors that are applied to the eventual bid cost and or willingness to bid that they pass on to you. So the more we can sort of make it easier, you know, like make it easier for them, the better. I mean, I don't think that, I think that if we, if we were doing construction in this site, that would be a constraint during construction to minimize the, um, the rest, the, how much you would take up of the rest of the park and that would impact how it was perceived by the contractors. Okay, and then on the parking with the swim center site, um, if we ended up with both of those facilities there, I'm just thinking, uh, you know, in, in hydrology, it's the probable maximal flood. But here, it is the probable maximal parking, which is city meet at a time where somebody's got a, having a wedding and the children are having, yeah, yeah, there's, there's some, there is a probable maximal parking. And it, it seems like this actually makes that much worse. It doesn't seem like there would be room for additional parking next to a facility there. No. It would all be across the park. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I think that's our assessment as well, is that there's not a good place to add immediately adjacent parking. And so the solution is, you know, priority, right? Like you have to prioritize the parking or people would come early, but it is an ideal that if you are all going, if everyone's going to a big wedding at the community center, then you might have to have people parking on the other side of the site. But I, I've been the parking guard during swim meets and that is an ugly job right there because yeah. the moms want to go to the playground. And you have to look at them and see, are they moms trying to sneak into the swim meet or are they moms really going to the playground? Um, and then the last question has to do with the pond. Um, I know it's kind of an older pond and it's kind of a little bit dated in style. Um, so when you talk about impacting it with construction, um, is that necessarily a negative? I mean, it would cost more, but does it give us an opportunity to um, update part of that? It, it does. I think that's sort of why that was a caveat that it might, you know, like especially around the existing swim center where there's this sort of bulwark and some of the funny access that maybe there's an opportunity to really make that circulation path nicer. I think that needs to be balanced against costs, and I, I believe, and Janine can step in, is that we probably need some more information about the original construction and the hydrology, and that's a, a, a more, it would need to be a more holistic effort that um, we didn't want the selection of site selection for this facility to be riding on something that is a bigger question with more impacts and isn't directly correlated to this. Is there a way to construct at the community center site without necessarily impacting the pond? Yeah. And just having it a great, a big, beautiful building next well, to a... Yeah, pond. and I mean, <laughs> you know, we're not at this point yet, but I think, you know, we'd have, there's like, not, it's not an all or nothing criteria. You know, the bulwarks might be able to be improved or that some outer pathway might be able to be improved without really changing the overall function of the the water part of it and I think that's something to look at but um, yeah again we just didn't want to tie what's happening with the pond to where is this okay. building located because those aren't I think those can be separate questions and the pond question has a lot more okay. um, variables and I'm gonna sneak one last one in because I said last question last time but I was wrong um, Heather farms I'm just thinking about the sound conflicts and because both the community center and Heather Farms are wedding venues, which have bands that go into the night, aren't those both sensitive and yet sound sources? That yeah, I, I mean, I think that's absolutely true. I think it's um, a lot of times the noise has to do with when is the noise happening and are people bothered by is there a conflict between when those noises are happening? And to be honest, that wedding related band noise wasn't one of the things that came up when people were concerned about the noise. So it's not that it's not real, it just wasn't a big yeah, factor, whereas- They don't perceive it as being over. Yeah, the, swim, enough, the so. sort of swim meet noise, the um, enhanced uh, loudspeaker voices, the- um, The beep. Area recorded music, those seem to yeah. be bigger factors when people were thinking about noise that they considered an impediment. So that's a perception as well as reality. All right, thank you.
Council Member Haskew? Y yes, I hope you can hear me. Um, so so I, I honestly have agreed with all three sites, and that would be three, pool, three pools and three buildings. <laughs> um, that probably isn't going to be possible. So um, when we're looking at the building, are, did I hear you correctly? You're going to do one story. You're looking at one story, and you know the further down in the valley, the more I think maybe we can gain some usable alternatives um, if we build the community center, say a two-story thing, and it wouldn't be in obstructing neighbors' views and and things like that, what what's happening there? Yeah, I'll just clarify for the sake of this exercise. We were assuming one story, just so that we could um, one story requires the most amount of land area, and so we were trying to determine which sites could accommodate. Um, the facility, and so that's why we're looking at the most conservative estimate. But that by no means um, is, is a decision that we've made that we will have only a one-story building. It's just for the sake of this exercise, we made that assumption okay. so that we could fairly um, evaluate the different locations. So yes, it's something that we will look at in the next phase. Is, is it two-story? Is maybe part of it two-story? If it's like a um, you know, the overlaps with this like sort of T or L configuration. So there's a lot of different options that we will look at. Okay. Um, back to the noise issue, which is um, I have heard from the people at Heather Farm Park. No, we're talking about Heather Farm Park at, at the um, flower place um, that we, they're interrupted by the picnickers as much, if not more, than the weddings at the at the um, facility cause sounds. That not all that much outside is happening, and it's it's inside. Um, I, how are we going to handle the fact that the closer we get to to more people and and more uses? Are we going to handle the conflicts in sound? Is there any way to do that? And is that something we go to later on? So um, I think a lot of the sound questions are will co will continue to come up throughout the design process. And I think um, there's a lot of uh, nuance that affects how so in the way things are configured that affects how sound actually travel. So proximity at this point is, you know, standing in for all of the other factors because it's sort of the one thing that we know. But as we get closer to it, the angle of the building, creating buffers with either plants or berms or landscaping are all really effective ways of mitigating sound. And sort of as we know better which program functions and which spaces go where, that's absolutely part of the um, design process to orient and mitigate some of the potential conflicts that occur. So this is n definitely not the last time that we're talking about sound and sort of the next level of um, design development is really understanding at a more detailed level what we can do to mitigate those conflicts. Okay, um, you've, we've talked about parking, but traffic, getting to and from, I, I, I remember you're talking about um, the middle one offers the most traffic flow because there are two entrances. Um, do you have anything further than that? Because if you have it all in one, one place or the other, and it seems to me the pool location has the most traffic flow right now because it's got lots of cross things. I'm sorry, are you asking about the circulation system that's in place, or are you asking about the volumes of traffic? Yes, both of them. If we, if we concentrate the, if we, for example, if we take it down to the community center site, then it's going to really concentrate it because you've got it, all the, foot, all the fields, um, people going back and forth to the dog park, and it's going to be on the, it just really pushes it all into, you know, and, and, you know, do we wind up doing a Central Park thing where we close the driving for everybody and who cares about parking? You're parking at John Muir Hospital. Um, 
it's, it, you know, what are we doing about, about concentrating all of those cars um, up and down the street? Um, well, you're right, there is an impact um, on traffic and that is something that we will look at once we have the final design as part of the sequel requirements. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, access, the, there isn't great access to, um, well, there's, there's different challenges with each site, basically. Um, I don't have a great answer for you of how we're gonna address it, this part to say that it's something that we've acknowledged and will be evaluated further as part of CEQA. I don't know if a traffic person has any, <laughs> engineer has anything to add. Good evening, Steve Waymeyer, uh, Assistant Public Works Director. Um, that's a great question, and that is something we're studying. One thing to keep in mind is that we get a good new chance to look at how the whole park operates in some ways, and we'll still keep a parking lot that's where the swim center is now, and that's not that far of a connection from that parking lot into this facility. And how we arrange the buildings, it could be that swimmers still park in that parking lot and have a, a connection there if you start looking at that. If you stand out there in the field and imagine a building in that location in the pool, we might have a nice connection that it's not that much further than if you're to park in the existing parking lot. And then it starts to separate some of the, um, some of the way the traffic kind of flows around. So I think there's a lot of opportunity actually to sort of start spreading apart the traffic depending upon how the buildings are arranged. So, so while you're here. I joked about asking you one more time about the pool condition. I'm, I'm not going to ask that question. Um, how really usable is the pool excavation? Is, is it, is it, do it, we, do we essentially have to, I'll, I'll try and keep it as clear as I can. Do we essentially have to re-excavate it for all the different configurations and equipment that we are going to need to do? And, you know, are we, mentally undervaluing putting the, replacing the pool? I think we're overvaluing the significance of the existing excavation site that's, that would be with the pool that's there now. We found that out when we did the Larky pool because essentially we had to re-tear it all out and then recompact it. So there's a lot more work that went into trying to use the existing site. It does, it does have some savings, I'll admit that, but you also kind of nail yourself into a location which may not be the ideal location too. So. I wouldn't use that existing excavation for the pool as a significant factor in making decisions on what you're doing. As you get a one chance to do something for the next 50 years and to save a few pennies to get the exact right thing that you need to do, I wouldn't put a lot of emphasis on that. Thank you. All right, I have a real off the wall question and it came from one of the letters. They were talking, I think about the birds, but I mean, do we have wildlife issues and those kinds of things? Does our choice impact the ecosystem of the park? Um, so the short answer is no, not, re not substantively, but I think a more detailed analysis of that would be part of the sequel process as well to ensure, but between the three sites, it's an existing, there, there are, except for the Middle Park site, which is in the middle of an existing park. These are all previously developed sites. We're not radically changing the ecosystem of the surroundings. And potentially, we have the opportunity, especially we're thinking with the community center site, to really improve the um, vegetation and the landscaping around the pond in a way that actually might make it better for the birds that are around. So that's. Thank you. Council Member Wilk. All right, I think, mo I think many of my questions have been answered, but I have a, a couple of others. Um, regarding the geese, so if that pond, yeah, I, know, I don't know who's <laughs> gonna answer this one, so I'll just throw it out there. Um, I was waiting for the geese question. <laughs> <laughs> so if the pond isn't there, do the geese go elsewhere? Or if we actually build the pool, do they then just go in the pool? I, I don't, do you have, do you have Well, the here? pond's gonna be there, right? Here, here. Like, oh. Well, maybe. I, I, I mean. Well, there's two. There's well, I'm not talking about the, uh, the natural pond, I'm talking about the man-made pond. No, understood, all of these options, none of these options eliminate the pond. 
I, I get that. Speak to the geese. Right. Um, <laughs> but we're talking about impacting the pond at one point in here, so it could be a more. So good evening. I'm Heather Ballinger, Public Works Director. I'm not a geese expert either. I will say that they do like water and they like the grass. And so they do like both of those, and that makes them come to Heather Farm Park and make them go up to Boundary Oak. But you're right, we're not eliminating the pond. Even if we were to eliminate the pond, which was one of the discussions that we had early on, if you might recall that, we talked about eliminating the pond or that it wasn't sacrilege. Um, but we have the nature pond, so they still will have water there. So I think the geese is still going to be a problem. Right. I'm just think, right. If they are in the nature pond, though, maybe they'll just stay in the surrounding area there and not. I mean, yeah. the they way I'm really looking at this is that the grassy area that there that's so beautiful, nobody walks on, nobody uses it because, right. let's face it, there's geese poop there. And they, they land on the grass. They don't land in the pond, but they use the pond for water. So. All right. So there we go. <laughs> um, uh, just I quickly want to clarify something. So the plan of the pool, we haven't decided upon the dimensions or anything yet, but the plan is to have two pools, right? Not three. Is that correct? That's correct. Two pools. And so the one larger pool then would have a deep water component that, that uh, synchronized swimming could be in and those kind of things. That's correct. Okay. Uh, it, so you're, you're mentioning that the cost for the building is the same pricing, but it would vary based upon the site location, but... Is there any kind of a cost that we can use to evaluate that? For example, how much are we talking about site prep and grading and the pool excavation? Well, it sounds like we're going to have that regardless on the pool excavation, but utilities and what's that number? Is it half a million, a million more? Um, when we, we looked at that a little bit more detail today, Lee and I looked over the numbers, and it's Really, the minimum differential between the three was somewhere around 500,000, and the maximum differential was around 1.5 million. Okay. So it was about, it was actually more like 2% difference. Okay. One to 2% so, difference. So the additional excavation, et cetera, that would be needed. So, okay. All right. Great. Uh, yeah, just to like sort of supplement that, I guess the takeaway is that all of those cost factors that I put on the slide and talked about are quite minimal in relation to the overall cost and at this phase in design are still really well within, you know, the expected contingency and variability that we can't predict anyway. So um, the cost differences between the sites are not especially significant. Okay. Okay. And then lastly, and it doesn't, it sounds like you've sort of touched on this, is there a time difference for how long construction would take in the different areas? Um, at this point, not measurably. I think we need it, it's, it's going to depend on a lot of other factors as well. And hopefully, the supply chain will have cleared up in two years, two or three years. But like at the moment, I, I refuse to predict anything about construction timing. Um, but there's not a measurable difference between the sites in terms of time frame. It's more in terms of how complicated will it be and therefore potentially how expensive will it be to do Right. It. So all things being equal, it's about the same. Yeah. Okay. I think that's my questions for now. Thank you. Good questions. I just had one follow-up then. Just from cheapest to most expensive, what were the cost differentials of the three sites? So in order of lowest to highest, swim center, community center, middle park site. Okay. I had them flipped. Okay, thank you. Can I ask one other question? Yes, Mayor Pro Sam Silva. So um, Council Member Wilk asked you a question that the answer surprised me. And that was that the um, lap pool would also have the deep water for synchronized swimming. And I looked over at Council Member Haskew and I can't read her face, but when we agreed to deepen the water at Larky, it was under an assumption, I remember those meetings, that there would not be deep water, a deep water pool at Heather Farm. And have has there been discussion about combining deep water with a, a competitive lap pool? Because that, that amount of water may change the speed of the pool. So I'm confused. But if everybody tells me I'm wrong and I don't remember correctly, that's okay too. 
we've been through this discussion so many times, it's sometimes hard to keep it straight. Um, I would suggest that um, while Larky is a deep water pool, that's 16 feet. Um, yes, Steve, 16 feet. Um, we would not be proposing 16 foot deep pool at Clark. It may be deep enough to accommodate some of the needs of the synchronized swim team, but not so deep as to be one for the older participants, which is what we have at Larky. So it wouldn't be a performance center for them? Because if you cannot accommodate the older swimmers, which are their premier swimmers and Olympians. We're I just, gonna have as many people as possible come up to answer your questions. So I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask Karen. And, and, and I hear the cars revving up at home and all those swimmers are coming down to give us their point of view too. <laughs> Good evening, council too. members. Um, there. Could you repeat your question, please? So I remember the conversations when we did Larky, which had to have been about 2015 when we were having the conversations. And it was that Larky would be bigger and deepened in order to accommodate Correct. So the, right the synchronized when, program, including their performances. Yes, when Larky, when we were looking at Larky, Larky was a six and a half to, I believe, a it would accommodate a one meter board. We deepened it. We actually took the um, shallow part and we made that deeper. Okay. So, so and my, then into a sh one meter. So my it, real point is, was there an expectation or has this um, changed that the, so a that the competition pool at Heather would ultimately have the depth of, to would, support synchro? Would be a combination of shallow and deep water, but not as deep as the current diving well now. So it'd be like a four foot to 12 foot that would accommodate a one meter board. And so does the 12 feet accommodate the older synchro swimmers? Yes. Okay. So, so all these costs assume that as well. Yeah. So wait, Karen, hold on one sec. <laughs> Just to follow up on Mayor Pro Tem Silva's. Just to be crystal clear here, the synchronized swimmers, the program that we just all saw, the wonderful program a couple months ago, that same program could happen at the new center at Heather Farm, wherever it is, whatever it's called. Yes, I believe, now <clears throat> don't 100% quote me, but I believe that, that the national team swimmers or the higher end level swimmers can get away or can compete in a 12 to 14 deep. You have, recall, that we had a 16 foot deep pool at Clark currently to accommodate diving, to accommodate the high level diving. If we're not doing high level diving, we can probably accommodate synchro between a 12 and 14 deep pool so at the, one end. So the flip side of the question is, does that level, of, does that depth for a competitive lap pool change the competition value? I don't I, believe so. Does it uh, say it one more time? I'm sorry. It's more water, <clears throat> deeper water. But I don't think it's, I don't think in the, what we've been talking about this whole entire time, I don't think we're increasing the depth from what we originally talked about. I'd have to go back and look at our discussions, but I believe that we have discussed a shallow to deep water pool to accommodate at least one meter diving and synchro. I, I think we should get further clarity on this issue, but I don't want to get sidetracked oh, yeah, from the yeah. location issue that we're supposed to weigh in on, on tonight. It was just the yes answer to the question that made me a little concerned mm -hmm. that we'd not start to drill down and verify that. Thank you. Maybe before we come to the next iteration of the council discussion, we can get just the clarification from that from staff on all these issues. That'd be helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so now we're gonna turn to public comment if any member of the public uh, wishes to provide comment at this time, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only, if you would like to provide a public comment. For those who desire to provide public comment on this item, please raise your hand now. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been and will during this item be posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not be read separately into the record. Also, please note that during public hearings and consideration items, group spokespersons are allotted 10 minutes in lieu of other members of the group speaking on the item. 
We trust that everyone will follow the rules. At this time, I'll ask the city clerk if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comments. We do have a couple hands raised on Zoom. We will go ahead and start with Jan Warren. All righty, good evening. Good evening. It's at Heather Farms today myself with my granddaughter at the playground. So grateful for that. Um, boy, this is, um, I'm glad we're moving forward. That's good, the good news. Um, some of my questions <laughs> have to do with thinking about all the other things, big events and all that are held at Heather Farms like the Art and Wine Festival. and and the way the, the, the traffic or how they're laid out. And so when we have other big events, uh, how those would work best, uh, at which site. Um, I'm also intrigued a little bit about uh, bicycles. Seems like if we put it over there where the community center currently is, then there's more access from the uh, bike path for people to come to the park on their bikes. Um, I am interested, I would assume that the, the pool number wise is more, gets more use if you want to average out over the year, uh, if you're talking about something being closed for two years, uh, than the other venues. And so from that standpoint, you'd probably not want to pick that site. Uh, we also know land is precious like gold. And I look at that little place where the pool was and it says, uses of new outdoor space. I have no idea what we would put there that would, um, you know, um, it's not close to anything else unless you're watching somebody at the skate park or something. I don't know. Um, and I'm hoping when we dig a new hole, we don't have any problems with um, uh, native uh, pottery and any anything else that would slow down our sequa. So you know, I, I, I'm good with either one of the sites. I just hope that we would consider uh, the, the people who live closest on the east side and the, the swimming pool eh, sounds and so forth and move, move ahead. <laughs> Next speaker is Meg Honey. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Meg Honey, Walnut Creek resident. I just uh, wanted to make sure I am representing the Walnut Creek Aquatic Foundation tonight, and I see that I have 10 minutes. I promise I will not um, use that whole time. Um, I have been uh, part of our city's aquatic community as an athlete, coach, supporter, and parent for over 35 years. Um, like I said, I will not come close to utilizing the full 10 minutes allotted to an organization spokesperson, um, but I am representing the Walnut Creek Aquatic Foundation tonight, and I'm here to articulate the foundation's support for a new aquatic facility to be constructed at the current community center site. Our support is in agreement with city staff's recommendation as the current community center site in Heather Farm Park is large, centrally located, and would allow for aquatic programming to continue at Clark Memorial Pool while construction is underway. Our aquatic community and supporters are engaged, mobilized, and counting on our city's leadership to ensure that the next generation of residents have access to a facility that is able to accommodate a variety of programs and is representative of Walnut Creek's commitment to health, safety, and multi-generational experiences. To that end, we are excited about being part of a project that maintains the current level of aquatic programming and services with hope that the new facility will also allow for expanded offerings. We continue to work with staff to construct an MOU in alignment with our foundation's mission to help conceive, fund, and build sustainable aquatic facilities that will allow recreational, learn to swim, competitive fitness and therapeutic aquatic programs to exist and thrive in Walnut Creek. We look forward to continuing this process and helping to ensure that a new facility 
continues the tradition of aquatic excellence in our community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. If you can just hold on for a second, I'll see if any of my council colleagues have any questions for you. Absolutely. No, I'm not seeing any. So thank you for joining us tonight. Happy holidays. And Mayor, there are no additional hands raised on Zoom. Okay, then we'll close the public comment and bring it back to the council. Any further final clarifying questions of staff? Just one. Okay, council member Darling. Um, I just wanna make sure people have the right expectations of what our decision here tonight is. We are going to go through and pick a, a location, but then when we do the CEQA analysis, um, we are going to go through a thorough CEQA analysis. That's right, if I could clarify the process, it's first pick the location, then I identify a couple of alternatives for, um, with a bit more detail of how those could be designed at two locations. Then we would pick the preferred location and then from there we would do the, the CEQA analysis. Did I get that right? Yeah, sorry, one, one location, location two options. Okay. Narrow down to one option, CEQA analysis on the one option. Okay, great, yeah. thanks. Okay, and I, I did have a, just a couple follow-up questions. We, we did receive several pieces of correspondence from the garden at Heather Farm and from folks uh, involved with the equestrian center. So I wanted to ask about outreach to either or both of those groups and kind of your reaction to maybe some of the comments which were essentially concerns about views and noise impacts to both of those facilities. Um, in terms of outreach for this phase, we were focused more on the, the programs adjacent to the study area, so we did not do outreach to the, the equestrians in this instance. We've met with them earlier in the process um, when we were working on phase, phase one programming, but not um, in this phase one implementation for the future location. The, the equestrian center, neither of those facilities would be physically impacted by any of these alternative locations, correct? Correct. Okay. And then, so maybe you could just speak, I know that we haven't done the sequence analysis yet, but maybe you can speak kind of generally, conceptually to noise and view impacts. Yeah, so I mean, I think that it's not gonna be so different from what I said before, which is that broadly moving the, no, the sort of really loud, the swim center noise, which is what we understand as a major point of concern, further away from the, both the gardens and the equestrian center onto the community center site is likely to be a net benefit, especially if, if as we are thinking, we might actually mirror the building and the pool so that the pool is actually buffered by a building rather than being immediately adjacent to the pond. So I think we have some ideas for how to address it. We think that the community center site offers the most potential ways of addressing it and sort of gives us the most tools at our disposal to make sure that it, it that noise is mitigated. Um, but again, you know, we'd need to, we'd sort of do a further round of figuring out what this facility might actually be. And then the CEQA analysis would give us some more measurable data to actually um, assuage any concerns, ideally. I think I may have missed part of your question about outreach, um, Mayor Francois. Were you also asking if we had done outreach to the gardens? And yes, we had done outreach to the gardens. Um, and we presented to them the three locations that we presented to you this evening and got feedback from them that mostly focused on um, concerns about noise impacts and views. Okay, which, which will all be studied carefully in the, in the CEQA document. That's right. <laughs> All right, and I see that we've got a public works, our public works staff member, Mike Vickers, has his hand raised. So perhaps, Susie, you could bring him in if he's got additional comments on this.
Mike, if you're there, you're on. If you can unmute. Okay. Well, I, instead of just asking for a motion, I think this is one worthy of having some discussion yeah. about. Yeah. So, um, who would like to lead us off? Good, Councilmember Haskey. Uh, um, I think I said this already. Um, every time I turned the page, I thought, "Oh yeah, this is the new next best place to put it." And so, I have voted personally for all three sides at least once or twice. Um, I I have decided on the that my basic favorite is the community center site. And there are a couple of reasons. One of which is I think that the space around the community center can be so much better used um, as a concentration of what it is um, and what we're trying to accomplish than even anything close to what we have now. Second of all, it is in the valley of the park, and I think it is the less obtrusive of the views from all the other areas around it. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And, and um, third, I, I just think that the advantage of having the views of the, of the park, uh, of the pond, are really significant if we're looking to make that a very strong rental unit. And so um, I'm concerned about the traffic going up and down that street, but maybe we'll have autonomous vehicles to take care of that by the time we get this done. <laughs> and, and I have, um, you know, I, there is no perfect site, uh, but that's my final vote. Great. As of now. Council Member Wolf. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, staff, for the presentation. I kept going back and forth in the different areas. As I'm re I was reading the report and, of course, through all the different meetings that we've had. Um, looking at the report previously and then tonight, I threw out the middle one. I just didn't think that. I think there were too many areas that, that was going to be problematic, from the large events that are at Heather Farm to just the breaking up the flow. So that one wasn't going to work for me. So really looking at it between the existing site and the community center site, the biggest issue that I've had with the existing site, even though for something like me, it's hard to envision a pool elsewhere because it, it seemed like it's always made such sense there, but the parking has always been a problem. And if we have the community center in that area as well, I just can't even fathom how the parking is going to go. We're going to end up covering all of the grassy area in the park just to make up for parking. So thinking about that, uh, really the community center site, I think, does make the most sense for me, whether you have the pool and, and however the configuration of that works. The current swim center site, we've talked about bocce for how many years? That actually would be a perfect area to potentially have bocce there. I think the equestrian people will probably be happy to hear that because <laughs> then we're not talking about the equestrian center for having bocce there. But, in, but bocce there could look like it would work. Um, there could be more parking around in different areas that would uh, be more amenable to where the community center site currently is. I think the traffic flows better in that direction than it does coming down the Heather Farm Drive and then again into that parking lot right next to where the All Abilities Playground is. Uh, and so with that, uh, and, and, and I've been on record before saying this, I am in favor of keeping all activities that currently occur in the Heather Farm Clark Swim Center to continue to occur wherever the pool is. And so that's what I'm in favor of. And I think that the best opportunity for that is at the community center. Great, Council Member Darling. Thank you, and thank you guys for going through this. It's got to feel kind of a grind sometimes, and we appreciate how your willingness to answer all our questions. Um, I agree with everything my fellow council members have said. Uh, one of the things that really leads me to the community center site is the fact that if you have a two-year construction window, that means that's two years where the kids don't have city meat, don't have county meat, don't have aqua bears, and this is going to be impacting the same generations that are, have been so impacted by COVID. And I, 
I don't want to take anything else away from them at this point. Um, so I'm in favor of the community center site for all the reasons mentioned and for that. Mayor Pro Tem. So first I'm going to thank staff and the consultant and all of the stakeholders in the community for the input that has been provided in this very thoughtful process. I, it's amazing to think that three locations can feasibly work without taking out the pond. So um, I appreciate that and I appreciate the um, pro and con analysis. I also just want to say I'm pleased to know that whatever the larger pool is, it would accommodate both the synchron some level of the synchronized program. Probably can't practice at the same time, but you know that's a different issue um, because I did not think that that was going to be true. So this is a good news, and the costs have estimated that. Um, as uh, Councilmember Haskew said, no site is perfect. If we're looking for the perfect, we will never do anything. So oftentimes when I looked at this and I looked at the pros and cons that were presented, I really focused on what's wrong with each of the three sites because those are, you have to prevent the most significant things from going wrong. And on th for that reason, I am supportive of the community center site. I think it has the greatest flexibility. I think it has the greatest opportunity to reduce the noise that travels from the pool up March Bank and into the gardens at Heather Farm. It doesn't go around that hill. I mean, it, it travels up somehow. The, um, I think um, Council Member Wilk is absolutely correct. You cannot add another activity into that would be relying on that parking lot that's between the All Abilities Playground and the pool. Um, and you can't expect people who are attending a more formal event to walk four blocks to get there from a ball field parking lot. The other thing is I don't think you have any views in the swim center site. The gardens at Heather Farm will not be able, I mean, it, it just, it's shoving 10, 10 pounds of rocks in a two pound bag. It just won't work. The, um, but I would add something else. I really do think we need to consider that this will be the centerpiece of the park, not the pools, not the, the flat water. And the playground right to this day has become, or since it opened in 2014, has been the centerpiece of the park. It is this wonderful thing you see as you're going north on San Carlos Drive. This new community facility, if it's architecturally designed well, will become the central piece of the park, the same that the Awani Hotel is the central thing you think about in terms of a building in Yosemite. So um, I'm looking forward to that and I appreciate um, all of that that um, everyone has mentioned. Well, I'm not going to disagree with these smart people. <laughs> I um, <laughs> When I was reading the staff report though, I I was saying community center site, community center site, and then I got to the staff recommendation. I felt like I should get a gold star because that was what staff recommended. And the only thing that held me up a little bit was the pros recommendation, but now I have a little further understanding that they weren't really asked to prioritize one over the other. I think all the reasons have been mentioned. Chief among them to me are the, that the swim center could remain open. It disperses parking as the city engineer said, which I think is a good comment. Um, did cause me to rethink I, the pond overlook I see as a value, but I don't see the pond necessarily as a value. Um, <laughs> the, um, it's the, fountain. the noise would be further from the gardens and the residents, and I think the buildings could be oriented to even provide e more noise buffering. And if the pool had to be, I know that I've worked on some projects where pools have had to be lowered a little bit, and that also reduces noise. I'm not sure that that would be needed here if the buildings already block the noise. And I thought, um, Ms. Warren made a good point about the proximity to the bike path and the, and the canal trail. So I think that's another positive of the community center site. So with that, do we need a formal motion on this or? Okay. I move to direct staff to pursue the community center site location two for the Heather Farm Community Center and the replacement Clark Swim Center. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion by the Mayor Pro Tem, a second by Council Member Darling. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mayor Pro Tem Silva? Aye. Council Member Darling? Aye. Council Member Haskew? Aye. Council Member Wilk? Aye. Mayor Francois? Aye. Motion carries unanimously.
We're going to take a 10 minute break now. Can break. we burn some things and warm them? <laughs> Are you cold? Oh, I'm not cold. No, I'm not um, cold. We'll be back at 840. <laughs>
settle down. <laughs> okay, welcome back to the December 21st City Council meeting. We have another consideration item. That would be uh, agenda item 5B, which is an interim urgency ordinance, a municipal code amendment to modify the land use development and tree preservation regulations in all single family residential zones to comply, to comply with new state law, SB 9, relating to second dwellings and subdivisions. Can we have a staff presentation, please, Mr. Smith? Certainly, Mr. Mayor. Thank you and uh, council. And I don't know if I should apologize or say you're welcome for clearing out the house here, but uh, in either case, I will move ahead briskly here. As you uh, mentioned, uh, this is a consideration of an interim urgency ordinance to address uh, the new Senate Bill 9. And let's try this again. I was warned that this thing does not behave well. Ooh, there we go. Um, in the interest of keeping this meeting short, here is the last slide. <laughs> but I will come back to this again. Our recommendation is to adopt the interim ordinance that's included as attachment one to the staff report and to uh, direct staff to begin work preparing permanent regulations in the coming year to address SB9. So what is SB9? And I have to note that I have used this picture that I took of the state capitol a while ago many, many times, and you have seen me in front of you many times talking about the latest state law. So uh, what well, is old is new again. Um, this time, this is again a housing law. Uh, it goes into effect on January 1. It was signed into law, I believe, in September. Um, and it effectively modifies single family zoning throughout much of the state. Um, where there is conflict between the state law and local zoning, uh, the state law does supersede the zoning ordinance. And um, this interim urgency ordinance that's been um, recommended by staff will help to maintain some level of local control as is possible under the new state law. So what does it do? In short, for single family lots or lots in single family zones, you could have up to four dwellings uh, per lot. Uh, and I know this is something where there's been some confusion uh, among the general public. Is it six, is it eight? It's, it's four. Um, there's a few different ways of getting there. Um, some that involve subdividing the lot into two lots, what's called an urban lot split. Others where you're not doing an urban lot split. So starting with where you're not subdividing, Basically, uh, you can have two single family dwellings plus an accessory dwelling unit, that's an ADU, plus a junior accessory dwelling unit, that's a junior or JADU, on a single family lot, or you can have one duplex and two ADUs. The other option, uh, splitting the lot, it's a two lot subdivision, and that urban lot split, that's actually a defined term straight out of the state law. It's a roughly half and half uh, subdivision of the uh, lot. And what's possible there is on each of the two resulting lots, you can have two single family dwellings or uh, one duplex on each lot. Um, if you exercise the urban lot split option, you're not allowed to have ADUs or JADUs, and you cannot further resubdivide the lot uh, using the provisions of SB9. If the resulting lots happen to be large enough that you could subdivide under normal zoning, you can still, or the property owner could still. Uh, seek further subdivision through those methods the normal way with public hearings and, and the like, but uh, you can't continue to resubdivide urban lot splits through SB9. Um, SB9 also waives or reduces many development regulations, development standards that are contained in the zoning. Um, first on the list is where the city is not allowed to require any kind of public hearings or discretionary review any kind of review, review that involves judgment uh, rather than just simple checklist yes, no for uh, construction of these units or an urban lot split. Uh, looking at development standards that apply to the construction of new housing, um, the side and rear setbacks are reduced under state law to no more than four feet. And uh, the city can only require one parking space per uh, unit uh, of, of uh, at least the units that are authorized under SB 9. And we cannot require any parking at all for those units if you're within a half mile walking distance of either BART station or within a half mile walking distance of a bus stop that is served by a route with more than 15 minute frequency of which none currently exist in the city. Um, looking at the lot development standards for subdivisions and the like, there's a 1,200 square foot minimum lot area um, imposed under SB 9, but as I mentioned, it's, the, the SB 9 also requires that it be roughly a 50-50 split 
Um, the, the offset size of the lots, it can't be more than a 60-40 offset. So if you happen to have an 8,000 square foot lot, you'd be looking at two 4,000 square foot lots or close to there. And uh, the uh, dim lot dimension standards, that'd be you know, width, frontage, depth, are effectively uh, nullified under SB9. Try this one again here. There we go. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I was warned this clicker is on, on its uh, deathbed, basically. Um, so there are also a pro there's also a prohibition under SB9 from the city requiring frontage improvements or right-of-way dedications uh, related to either construction or subdivision. Frontage improvements is uh, planner and engineer speak for curb, gutter, and sidewalk construction. So uh, usually when you subdivide land, you've got to actually improve the, uh, uh, you know, your street frontage up to current standards. We cannot do that under urban lot splits uh, or for construction of SB9 units, nor can we require dedication of land for parks or school sites. However, we can continue to charge in lieu fees uh, for those, which is in fact usually the case for small two-lot subdivisions. It's too small to really require land dedication anyway. I have to hit the button, wait to see if it reacts. Try again, there we go. Um, regarding the actual occupancy of SB9 units, um, owner occupancy is required on the property for an urban lot split with a uh, Roger Maris asterisk there. Um, basically, the state law says that we can only require essentially an affidavit by the property owner saying that, that it is their intent to occupy the property for three years following the subdivision. But there is no enforcement mechanism allowed to actually enforce that should the owner decide to change their mind and no longer intend to live there. Um, we are otherwise prohibited from requiring owner occupancy regarding lot splits. Um, also, uh, the state law prohibits short-term rentals. Minimum occupancy is 31 days uh, for anything built um, in accordance with SB 9. Um, one important proviso, proviso is that pretty much any of these development standards, so notwithstanding the foregoing, any of these development standards except for that four-foot side and rear setback, have to be waived as necessary in order to accommodate 800 square foot dwellings uh, under this provision. So for example, if the only place left on a property to build another unit is in the front yard, in the front yard setback, we have to waive that front yard setback to accommodate that 800 square foot unit. So where does it apply? Basically all single family zones. And those are as indicated on this map here, the purple areas. Uh, there's about 12,000 single-family lots in Walnut Creek. Uh, they occupy about 75% of all of our residentially zoned land, but they actually only consist of about 37% of our total housing stock. There are some limited exceptions for things such as flood zones, the 100-year flood zones, and you'll see here we've got the, um, some of the details. So there, you've got the Lancaster neighborhood. There's an area there. Um, along Homestead and Walnut, uh, part of Pine Creek out by Northgate High, and a small area in the north part of town near Pleasant Hill adjacent to the East Bay Mud Aqueduct that are in 100-year flood zones. And the staff report, uh, the way it was written, indicated that basically SB9 does not apply in these areas, and that was based on an earlier read of the, of the law. It since has been clarified that SB9 does still apply in these areas. However, development has to comply with both federal and city flood regulations, so for example, if you're building a house, it has to be raised above the actual flood water level. Um, that is reflected in the draft ordinance. Um, however, that clarification was not um, uh, changed in the staff report, so I did wanna highlight that. Um, another area where it's not an outright prohibition, but there are some additional requirements and restrictions is in earthquake fault zones, specifically the state designated Alquist Priolo fault zone, of which we have one in Walnut Creek along the Concord Fault on the east side of Ignacio Valley. Uh, you'll see it there, kind of roughly follows Pine Creek. And basically within that area, the, there are additional seismic standards that apply uh, related to building code. Um, in terms of outright prohibitions, uh, as I understand it, there are some limited circumstances such as you can't build directly on top of a fault trace, that sort of a thing. Other areas where there are prohibitions, uh, or I should say just outright exemptions from SB9. Uh, SB9 does not apply when it involves the demolition or alteration of affordable housing. So that is rent, or I'm sorry, income restricted, uh, lower income housing. That would include things such as inclusionary units. 
Uh, likewise, it does not apply to the demolition or alteration of rental housing, and that is defined in the state law as basically any housing unit that has been occupied by a rental tenant within the last three years. Hazardous waste sites are also excluded, uh, basically anything on the state's Cortese list. Uh, I don't have this mapped here, but that information is available online. Uh, there's a number of sites scattered throughout the city. Few, if any, exist in our single-family zones. They basically consist of gas stations, both old and new. Uh, and then lastly, there are endangered species, endangered species habitat areas and conservation easements. Um, some do exist in Walnut Creek. Uh, they're relatively few to the best of our knowledge, and in general, they occur in undeveloped hillside areas. This is something we'll, of course, check on a case-by-case -case basis as permit applications come in, but uh, we don't expect them to uh, apply widely. So what is proposed in this urgency ordinance? We've heard about what is SB9 put on us. Well, what is it that we're looking to do through this urgency ordinance? One is just the minimum required to comply with SB9. This is actually modifying our zoning ordinance as is required um, by the state law. And then uh, in terms of additional standards that we can do under SB9, looking to have a 16-foot, one-story height limit for new units built under this, and an 800 square foot floor area limit. And I will note that that 800 square foot floor area limit, that is the smallest maximum size that we are allowed to implement uh, as per SB9. Uh, also looking to add uh, design standards, objective design standards uh, for SB9 units. So first, there are the objective standards for single family dwellings that generally apply across the city. And these are essentially excerpted from the existing design review guidelines we went through uh, in response to some other state laws uh, that have occurred recently, uh, identifying objective standards that happen to exist in the otherwise subjective guidelines, um, residential guidelines that have been in place since 1996. Additionally, recommending that all of the designs and development standards that apply to ADUs apply to SB9 units, uh, and that's actually in the draft ordinance. And that includes things about architectural compatibility, design for garage conversions, hillside lots, um, et cetera. And then there's tree preservation. Our tree preservation um, regulations is a fairly uh, subjective process uh, in the code as it is. So we're recommending an objective standard that nothing be built within or under the, the drip line or the canopy of a highly protected tree. And a highly protected tree is something that's defined in the code. It's basically uh, any large tree of a, that falls within a list of native species. Um, and that, that's, that's taken from something that's in our existing regulations. This is a table comparing uh, basically all of the rules that are impacted by this, uh, um, by SB9. And um, the default column is essentially what would the standards be if an urgency ordinance was not adopted? The, and then of course the far right column is what's being recommended in the urgency ordinance. Um, things to note is uh, that I haven't already discussed is parking, um, recommending of course one parking space. SB9 does not get into the details of the design of the parking, so we're recommending that it be one covered space, a garage or a carport, which is in line with our existing covered parking standard for sing regular old single family homes. Um, lot dimensions, looking at requiring a 24-foot wide access to any newly created lots, like if, in the case of a flag lot, that's generally in line with fire district standards as well as utility access uh, needs. And um, like I said, everything else I have pretty much have already talked about or there is no difference between the two because we don't have that flexibility under the state law. Something that's important to note is these ones that I've highlighted in gold are the development standards that could be waived or would really automatically be waived in cases where if they otherwise, quote, physically preclude the construction of the 800 square foot units, we have to waive those. So the example I gave of building in the front setback earlier, for example. And so that's setbacks and height. Curiously, not that four foot setback requirement uh, for the side and the rear, but all other setbacks, height, parking, design standards, lot dimensions and the tree preservation rules. So if the only place to build on a property is underneath that 300 foot, 300 year old Valley Oak, unfortunately state law does require us to authorize that. Hopefully that will not come to pass and honestly I'd be surprised if it would. So what might this actually look like in actual practice? I've got an example here of a very typical lot in Walnut Creek. Um, this is a 10,000 square foot lot, it's R10 zone. I will note that 45% of the single family lots in Walnut Creek are within 
uh, are between 10,000 and 15,000 square feet in lot area. So this is really super common. Um, and in fact, if you bump that up to 16,000 square feet, that's fully half of all the single family units. It's already got a house and a garage, as you can see. Possible options, if you did not do the urban lot split, would be to keep the existing house, convert the garage into a JADU, build a new uh, 800 square foot, one story, single family home in the back, and up to a 1,000 square foot ADU in the back, uh, as is uh, allowed under state law if for a two bedroom unit. Um, so that's one possible option, kind of max build out. Another option is if they were to, if the owner were to convert the house into a duplex, uh, that would include converting the garage. Uh, duplexes under state law and local ordinance are considered multifamily dwellings and therefore under other state law, they are allowed to have two detached ADUs, one story tall but with no floor area maximum. So I've shown there the possibility of having two detached ADUs. And then there's the, the third possibility or the third scenario, which is frankly, I would say fairly unlikely on lots of this nature because it would involve uh, the partial demolition of the house. And this is an urban lot split. We're creating a flag lot to the rear of the property. Um, and that getting the flagpole access to the rear involves shaving off part of the garage, but then converting the remaining portion of the house to a duplex and building a one story 1600 foot square foot duplex in the back to 800 square foot units with um, garage. Uh, that's shown here. Again, I don't see this as being a really viable um, option, but just wanted to show that. So what happens if the city does not adopt, or if this council does not adopt an urgency ordinance? In essence, the standard height limits would apply, which in 99% of the cases is 25 feet, two story height limit. Um, there would be no floor area limitations on SB9 units there'd be no design standards, and there would be no tree protection standards. And so for that reason, we are recommending adoption of the interim ordinance, urgency ordinance um, attached to the staff report and asking also that you direct staff to begin work preparing permanent regulations in the coming year. And I will note that as an urgency ordinance, this does require a four-fifths vote for adoption. And the initial uh, uh, period uh, for uh, for the ordinance would be for 45 days, and then following a notice to public hearing, the city council can extend that by 10 months and 15 days for a total of a year. And then following another public notice to public hearing, the city or the city council could extend the ordinance for one final year, uh, at which point it would uh, become null and void under state law. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, any questions of staff? We'll start with Council Member Darling. I only have one question. That's why I get to go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I, I apologize. I forgot to mention there's an errata sheet that has been sent around. Okay. Um, very important. Somehow we've, in, in all this conversation about 800 square foot maximum floor area, we forgot to actually include it in the ordinance. So that is in that errata sheet. Very important, as I did note, if you do wish to adopt the ordinance as recommended by staff, uh, please do make sure to include that. I apologize for interrupting. Thanks, Andy. As usual, very thorough, very comprehensive. Um, so we cannot require in those areas where there is no curb gutter and sidewalk, we cannot require that. Uh, many of those areas have existing right-of-ways across the lots. Are they allowed to build into that right-of-way, or do we still control that? So the city attorney might actually wind up jumping in and helping me with this, but um, there are different forms of ownership for right-of-way. There are some cases where the city actually owns a right-of-way in fee title, in which case, of course, no construction, you know, private construction can occur in there, and the city cannot require the improvements because that would be off-site. Then there are situations where when you look at the deed, the meets and bounds, it does go out to the center of the street, and then the city has something akin to an easement uh, in the form of a right-of-way across that. Um, and that's, that situation is actually where I will defer to the city attorney with regard to the ability to require improvements. The city can um, require on-site improvements if, it, if the uh, property owner owns to the center line of the road. So, so, if, so for instance, if you had, it, you had a single family lot and they were doing work on, the, on either the lot or if it's a split, the front lot, then you could require uh, street improvements on the land that they own that is associated with the lot that is being modified. 
Okay, but if we own the not off -site title, that would be technically off site. Uh, correct. That would be an off site improvement if we own fee title. That's and correct. then can they, um, if there is an easement, like our property has a part of the flood control system goes under one side of it, can they build on something like that or are those easements? So easements, um, in the example that you gave is typically would be something owned actually by the flood control district, in which case there's a, a simple ownership issue there right. that would prevent that from occurring. Uh, in terms of city right of way, um, the, the, the city's right of, rights of right of way uh, would preclude construction actually within that area. And then the way our zoning ordinance is written, um, the, uh, the, the end of that right of way is treated as a de facto front property line from which our setbacks would be measured. Okay, and then if we pass this tonight, we will do a more thorough and more public outreach as we go through with uh, revision to this. Does that sound? Yes, as far as um, the creation of permanent regulations, um, that would it'd be a much more um, thorough process. Um, this is something where essentially the state law was adopted without providing us time to actually go through that process. And so state law also allows the city council to adopt urgency regulations as kind of a stopgap measure, if you will, um, which is what this is before you today. And then the hope is, is that as we go forward with that, everybody else will be doing the same thing and we'll make sure that we're, we understand the implications of what we're. Yes, looking at uh, things such as accessory dwelling unit regulations and really any other number of, of uh, state interventions, um, as more time goes by and more uh, jurisdictions have a chance to kind of noodle over the subject, um, clarity comes out of that. And so that would, of course, make it easier uh, for permanent creation of permanent regulations as opposed to the situation where we find ourselves now. Okay, thanks. Mayor Pro Tem. So at least I sent you my questions in advance. So I thank you for the clarification and all the work on this because I know this is complicated and um, this was talked about for more than a year across the state and there were a lot of rumors that this was six, eight, ten units per property and it's good to know that this is four. <laughs> um, but I do have some questions about so let me just start, I'm gonna to go to where um, the permanent regulations that we would adopt. If you can go back to the slide that shows what's the differences between if we do it or we don't, it really seems maybe back two slides or one slide. Nope. Actually, it was, the one with it, the it was one with a question mark. Oh, that one. Okay. Right. I'm sorry. I thought so it was the one really with the table. So if really this urgency or, well, I thought they were right next to each other, so I'm going to take the easiest one to find, which is the one with the question mark. If this urgency ordinance basically allows us to have these. Almost there. This clicker. There we go. It appears, and just, uh, why I could be wrong that these are the issues we will be discussing in terms of the permanent regulations because these are the things that we've been able to do custom. So we're not going to be discussing can we have fewer homes per... Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, you mentioned, okay, the parking standards, and maybe you can go... I, I can't quite figure out what the parking would be for all of those um, little site plans that you oh yeah I can I can go through that actually and, and this is a good thing to discuss because this is actually where some of these uh, and I think it might be helpful to have a table with if this is the alternative this is the number of, co of covered parking spaces you have to have because this is just so if you have one single family dwelling unit and a second single family dwelling is is it two or is it three? So it, it, this is an example, it's in front of, or I'm sorry, I was thinking of what's on the slide instead of listening to your question. Could you restate that please? How many required parking spaces for the whole lot? That's right there? Yeah. In this, it would be actually one covered space for that second single family dwelling. And what's required for the first? Nothing. 
because it's the junior accessory dwelling unit is the garage conversion and under existing state law, the junior accessory dwelling unit garage conversion, the JADU does not require parking and the conversion of existing parking for that house, we cannot require replacement of that parking. That's under existing ADU law. Okay, so what about off street parking as opposed to covered spaces? So if you have, if you have a driveway on the house right now, so if you use the hypothetical that the garage gets converted to a J ADU, okay. your off street parking would be, in this scenario, it would be um, the driveway that accesses the former garage. And then for the, for the one SB9 unit, you could require one space provided that the lot is not within those uh, distance requirements to a, a transit station. So they would have to put a carport on that driveway because you can't get a car to the unit. Is uh, correct. Potentially. Well, they would have to do that. Correct. Because you, you can't get a car back to the back unit or they may have to put it somewhere else within the front. Okay. So then next, next example. Let's just see if we can figure how many, how many uh, off street spaces and how many must be covered? Here it would be two covered parking spaces. For the duplex. For the right. duplex but, and then but, no parking for the ADU. Yeah, but let's be clear. This is not an SB9. These are ADU, so go, go to the SB9s. No, this is SB9 for the duplex. Converting the house into a for duplex. The, for, the, for the single family, converting that to a duplex. Yes, that's authorized under SB9, and, and, and you can only require two, one covered space per unit, so in that case, two. The ADUs, we, we would not have a requirement for parking. Okay, next. So now we've created, the single family home has become a duplex, yes. so that's two. Yes. I'm trying to do my math. So yeah. two, two, two spaces for the back, two spaces for the front. This is a case, however, where it it's a lot. you might be able to say it's a physical, you know, requiring the parking would be, you know, would physically preclude the construction of the units. There, it's, that's a possibility, that, or it just it it's, goes into the front yard and the front setback is waived for a carport or something. Okay. Is there another one? No, that's all. So um, can you tell me... Thank you. Maybe we can put that in some kind of table, because I really liked the other table that you had in the slides. Maybe there's another table that might be helpful to mm -hmm. everybody getting the same answer when they call in for the question. The um, Why would I want to do, what's the advantage of this versus an ADU? Honestly, well, you're, it's possible to do more units in this case. Okay, so this gets me from three to four. This gets you, well. Single. So just with, yes, I'm sorry, because there's the JADU. Yeah, okay. it gets you from three to four. That is correct. All right. Of the. With the second being a JADU. With, well, or the third, yeah. It'd be, a, it'd be a, a house, a second house, a JADU, and an ADU. Okay. So. Um, the smallest lot we can uh, require, allow, uh, require is 1,200 square feet, which translates to a, the whole parcel being, or in the subdivision, the original parcel being 3,000 square feet. How many 3,000 square foot parcels do we have in Wal Walnut Creek? If 45% yeah. are between the, the size of... Or, or conceivably, it could even be a 2,400 square foot lot if you did a, a straight 50-50 subdivision with okay. 1,200s. Um, I don't have the exact number, but I can say very few. Our smallest base zoning district that we have right now, not smallest base zoning district, our single, our, our single family base zoning district with the smallest minimum lot area is the uh, SFH PD1, which is a small zone up near Geary. And there the minimum lot size at its smallest is somewhere between 48 and 4,900 square feet. Um, but for a vast majority of the rest of the city, okay. our smallest base zone is R8, which is an 8,000 square foot minimum lot area. So um, you cannot do this if your single family home has been rented within the last three, year, the three years. That's within, not continuously. Correct. So that could have been a month. Yes. Okay. Just, and... Um, 
occupancy from the time of subdivision. How long is the subdivision occurs before construction, does it not? Uh, yeah, yes. So basically, they probably can move out after construction. If they time it right, they can move out. The well, I mean, if construction takes th three years, yes, and and honestly, the as you could probably tell, the owner occupancy requirement under the state law is, is uh, doesn't have much teeth. That was the word I was going to use. So we can collect the park fees. The schools are allowed to collect the school fees, yes. just not receive dedicated land. Yes. Okay. Had to read that over and over, and I finally. Um, what about larger parcels that might be? zoned single family but are an acre or more large does this can they manipulate this or in fact they just have to, that would have to go through a regular subdivision process i mean if they have let's say you have an a, a one acre lot through an urban lot split you could split it into two half acre lots each with two units or you could just build four units you know two homes and the adu and a jadu on that one acre lot um, but in reality if you have a one acre parcel, you could also build four homes and then put an ADU and a JADU or an ADU on each of them and have eight homes. It depends on the zoning, but let's say if you're in a, you know, a R10 zone and you have a 40,000 square foot lot, R10 is a 10,000 square foot minimum lot size, you could go through the normal subdivision process to create four 10,000 square foot lots and then use SB9 on those each. And is that allowed because you have, oh, how does that ownership? It, 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 it is allowed if you if you do it in the order that Andy indicated it. So okay. SB9 does not prevent multiple lot splits if the lot splits are done initially compliant with the subdivision ordinance of, of the city. The only time the SB9 prohibition on further lot splits applies is when you do an SB9 lot split. And that's just a prohibition against additional SB9 lots, correct? Yes. As opposed to if you have that one acre lot in a R10 zone, you use urban lot split. Yeah, it would, it, it would be highly unlikely that someone would split an acre lot in Walnut Creek under SB9 because you would lose tremendous value on the lot because you could only put, you know, assuming the council didn't allow larger lots, ultimately, even in the permanent regulations, you would be building much smaller houses on the units than you would on yes. the the, um, what is a conservation easement? Can you give me an example of one? So a conservation easement can cover a, a large number of things. Typically, I mean, it'll, in, in the, the simplest way I can describe it is something where it's essentially a no, an easement that enforces or creates a no-build zone for the purposes of conserving the environment. So, so it, it, where I've seen them exist in Walnut Creek are actually like hillside conservation areas or hillside preservation areas where it's essentially a no-build zone on kind of okay. undeveloped hillside that's up above where there was a residential development. I know that came up in some of our um, neighboring communities when they were discussing this. Um, a plan development PD with some single family residential. We have one very large one, I think. We have many. Um, but do they, do we have pl uh, PDs with a lot of res single family residential? Yes, uh, Red Gear Estates is, is okay. one that comes to mind. Uh, Larry, Larry at Estates, much of actually southern, much of the southern part of the city is that way. So what about Rossmore and the single family homes, not the duplexes, there's a, Mutual 68 has yeah. single family homes, I think it's 68. Um, are the, is that then allowed in that one spot? Is that purple on the, the map? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, it's not purple on the map, actually. The way the map, we had we had a limited amount of time to prepare the map, and so I, I the direction I gave to our GIS person was to just exclude Rossmore entirely. You are correct, though, that there is a neighborhood kind of in the southeastern, far southern right. portion where it's single family homes, and it, it would apply there, but it, it's a it's a small area. And I would add that unlike some other state laws, this SB9 doesn't have an express override of private restrictions that attach to property, so yeah. CCNRs and whatnot. So to the extent that you have a development okay. that has private restrictions, SB9 is a, is a requirement that applies to the, either the city or the county, whoever the land use authority is. 
Can I ask a quick question? I just want just a point of procedure that we're we're looking to be able to potentially adopt an emergency ordinance to meet those state requirements, right? We're not we're not looking to adjust anything of what the state law is right now. It, I just want to make sure that yeah, it's, I'm, it's, I'm losing track of what we're so, so getting it's a, to right it's here. It's a little bit different. So state law has set the basic requirements, but in doing so, it is it has allowed cities to regulate in certain areas and what the ordinance that Andy's discussing with you tonight is regulating in those areas on an initial basis before permanent regulations go through the planning commission and come back to the city council. So for instance, as uh, the mayor pro tem noted, SB 9 says that your regulations cannot effectively prohibit a less than 800 square foot mm -hmm. unit but SB 9 does not say that you have to allow anything larger than an 800 square foot unit. And so the ordinance that's before you tonight says an SB 9 dwelling unit is limited to a maximum of 800 square feet. So that's one thing that you're adopting tonight that state law allows you to adopt, but it doesn't actually say that, that you have to put a cap on it. It allows it actually to go higher. Um, there are other instances, uh, the tree protection that Andy identified tonight uh, kind of objective subdivision and objective design standards. So a house shall be compatible with the primary house in terms of its architectural design. Um, those are objective standards that you can impose and this ordinance is doing that. Okay, thank you. On an interim basis. Okay, thank you for allowing me to ask. So why the 16 foot height restriction? That's only a single story. Yes. Why? Why? Um, it's a, it's a mat for purposes of this short-term urgency ordinance, uh, we were looking at kind of maximizing compatibility. And though I don't have an exact number, so, uh, at least half, just based on my general knowledge of the city, I would say at least half of the single-family homes in Walnut Creek, and likely as many as three-quarters, are single-story. And so I was looking at maintaining compatibility with the existing neighborhoods. But that is, of course, something that, uh, you yeah, know. We can, we can discuss because the pros and cons are if you restrict it to a single story at 800 feet, you're consuming more of the lot. Yes. A two-story will take up less footprint. Yes, and that, and that is a uh, definitely a subject that we had intended to uh, okay. explore in greater detail as part of the uh, creation of permanent regulations, but it is certainly within the purview of the council to discuss tonight as far as the uh, urgency ordinance as well. I, I appreciate you answering my questions because having had as many discussions about this in the last year, clarity when, if we can all be clear, we can answer other people's questions in the grocery store. Four, four, again we say four, even if you split the lot, it's two and two. I mean, that is really, really important because there's been a lot of rumor and misinformation floating around. So thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Council Member Haskey, do you have any questions? Council Member Wilk has asked. I just had a, it, it kind of when, when Mayor Pro Tem was asking about the covered lot, I was not seeing the advantage of that additional regulation in that example that you gave, that we'd be forcing someone to put a carport on a driveway in order to comply with that requirement, at least in that particular example. So, um, like with the uh, the height limit, um, you know that is something that we would we anticipated exploring in more detail um, as far as the creation of the permanent regulations. The intent uh, in including them now in the urgency ordinance was to maximize neighborhood compatibility, given that that is covered parking is generally required for uh, single family homes in almost all of our single family uh, zones uh, currently, but. You do, of course, uh, raise a valid point uh, with regard to that particular instance. Okay, I, if there aren't any other council questions, I think we should open it up for public comment. Uh, so if any member of the public wishes to provide comments at this time, please use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only. For those who desire to provide public comment, please raise your hand now. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make their oral remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted have been and will during this item be posted by to the city's website for public review. 
and are included in the meeting record but will not be read separately into the record. Also, please note that during public hearings and consideration items, group spokespersons are allowed, allowed 10 minutes. We trust that everyone will follow the rules. At this time, I'll ask the city clerk if there are any members of the public who would like to provide comment. We do have one hand raised on Zoom. We'll go ahead and bring in Jan Warren. It's really helpful to see the outline on an existing lot uh, and seems to me like uh, the tree issue is, is going to be an issue for anyone who wants to <laughs> put an ADU in, in the back, uh, even if you have room for everything else. Uh, the thing I wasn't familiar with was the the covered parking. I always thought everything, if you were within a uh, you know half mile or whatever of transit, uh, you know people could park on the street. It seems to me that I see people who have used side yards or well rarely front yards in, in our city, but um, a carport. Um, almost seems ugly, more ugly than a than somebody parking on the street to me. But uh, anyhow, I, I appreciate the presentation tonight. Thank you, Jan. Oh, Jan, we got a question for you. If you could. No, 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 no. No, we sorry, don't. Jan, no. no, we don't. Okay. False alarm. Nice to Council see you, Jan. Ask you. Happy, Next time. <laughs> ha happy, happy holidays. Um, I have a question about process in terms of. This has a 40 day, 45 day lifespan. If we think about it more and there's some small thing that we wanna change and yet continue the constant is, and just do the, the rest of the year, um, is that a big deal or is it not? Um, it is not. You could modify the ordinance when you extend it because this is only effective for 45 days, it will come back to you for an extension at your meeting in January because we will likely be beyond 45 days when we get to the first meeting in February or we'll be very close. And so at that point, you have the opportunity to extend it for either 10 months and 15 days or up to two years, a total of two years. And the council could modify it at that point. Also, once you adopt the permanent regulations, then this ordinance will cease to. Uh, be operative at that point. I was going to ask the clerk, any any other public comments? Uh, no additional public comments. Okay. Any other questions of, of staff? No, but I have a comment. Yes. Which is, given where we are in the year and given where the staff has spent a significant amount of space, I'm just guessing we are not going to be overrun with anything that will defy anything that we passed tonight. And there is good reason to do this ordinance. And so I am going to move that we, uh, with the errata sheet included, uh, accept the ordinance as presented. A second. Okay, we've got a motion by Council Member Haskin, a second by Council Member Wilk. Discussion? Yes. Um, I agree with the motion, but I have a request that when it comes back, the ordinance, I think there's some inconsistencies within the ordinance that need to really be checked. There were two lists of the exceptions and the lists are different. And it seems like maybe one time and refer back. So I, I think there's a, an editorial cleanup opportunity. Um, otherwise I would support the ordinance. Is, 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 the if that is an amendment, um, I am believe no, that's not an amendment. Okay. I just is if we can do that It's it. I wanted to make a point that there were some things in there that I sent also that were questions about that Okay, we've got a motion and a second madam clerk. Could you please call the roll? Councilmember Haskew. Aye. Councilmember Wilk. Aye. Councilmember Darling. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Silva. Aye. Mayor Francois. Aye. Uh, motion carries unanimously. Okay, I believe I'm owed a beer. And with that, uh -oh. we are adjourned.
don't know. Because he's talking. He doesn't even hear us. <laughs> what are you saying right now? Hi. Hi. Hi.